All right, guys, we are live and we are very excited. We are playing Pioneer for Friday Night Magic. I'm Brad and this is the Paradise Games live stream. And we're watching Caleb playing against Patrick. Uh, Patrick, he says he's mono counters. I believe this is a blue white control deck. And then Caleb is on Mardu Cat Pact. It's also a Doom Foretold prison deck. Uh, so Caleb has probably 24 creature removal spells in the main board, uh, which will not interact very well against this mono counters deck. Um, but he is trying to play Demonic Pact, which is going to draw him a whole mess of cards if he can get it to resolve. And Doom Foretold, uh, which Patrick will have a hard time sacrificing permanence to, I presume. We're already on round two, and Caleb is coming out of the gates slamming a 3-1. Uh, this is Shepherd of the Flock. It has an adventure that's a one mana instant that says return a permanent you control to its owner's hand. Um, it's mostly there to uh, pick up your doom foretold so you don't have to sack something, pick up your cat pact so it doesn't kill you, um, sack your oath of Kaya, um, sorry, pick up your oath of Kaya so you can replay it. Now it's going to get Azorius Charmed so it's put on back on top of the library. Um, but it has a very neat interaction uh, against the mono counters deck where. You can play a Shepherd of the Lost, and then you can use a Shepherd of the Lost to pick up your first Shepherd of the Lost, which is probably what Caleb just should have done there. Um, that way, rather than draw it, uh, he would have it in his hand, and he would be able to then cast this one from uh, the Exile Zone via the Adventure Mechanic. This is Narset Parter of Ales. Uh, so she's going to take it down to three, which is the perfect number for that Shepherd of the Flock to nix her. And Patrick is looking at two Detention Spheres and a Settle the Wreckage. Detention Sphere is an excellent answer to Demonic Pact. Um, looks like Caleb has a couple Dreadbores in his hand. So he's probably not going to waste that combat step on that Narset. Um, Patrick is taking a Settle the Wreckage, which is going to answer the Shepherd of the Flock, but it's going to answer it by turning it into a land, so that's not really that clean. He's getting in... Oh, so he is using the Shepherd to kill the Narset. Um, he drew that other Shepherd, so then when Patrick settled the records one Shepherd away, Caleb will get to pick up the Shepherd if he chooses to. Um, so then Caleb doesn't have a use for his mana. Patrick draws another card, untaps with five mana, and in Pioneer, the control decks at five mana can slam to Fairy. And when you slam to Fairy, you get to take him up and draw a card. Uh, and then untap to Lance and protect him with negates or disdainful strokes or what have you. Ah, the Shepherd of the Flock attacks and a Castle Ardenvale is activated, making a 1-1, which makes that 3-1 look rather silly. Um, again, Caleb didn't use the uh, Shepherd of the Flock's adventure ability to protect his creature, uh, which I find a little suspect. Now Patrick's untapping with six mana, Caleb's still on three. And Patrick passed the turn and then waited for Caleb's untap, or sorry, draw step, uh, and activated a Field of Ruin to destroy a non-basic. This is going to allow Caleb to get a basic. Uh, often the reason you do that during the draw step is because they might draw the basic. And if they draw the basic, then they don't have one to find. Um, Patrick doesn't know exactly what Caleb's mana base is. Um, but in this case, when you know your opponent's struggling on mana, I really like uh, letting them uh, search before they draw to just take one land out of the deck so that it's a little less likely that they find a land with that draw step. Now, Caleb had drawn a card, but he did not find a land, so it looks like he's going to go to his cleanup step. He does have a Harmless Offering in his hand, which looks real bad when you're not able to get anything going. He also has a Trial of Ambition, which is not going to kill anything this game. Looks like he's tanking on what to discard. He has both Harmless Offerings in his hand, uh, but he says, go to the end of my turn, and Patrick says, before you discard, I'm going to cycle my Azorius Charm. Uh, so now, Caleb is discarding the Trial of Ambition, so that's a two-mana enchantment that when it enters the battlefield, your opponent sacrifices a creature. Um, it's part of the removal suite, one, because it's a permanent that you can sacrifice to your Doom Foretold, having already gotten value out of it, and two, you can pick it up with your Shepherd of the Lost and replay it later. Uh, here is a Gyre Reach Sanitarium. It has a two-mana activated ability that says each player loots. Um, it's part of the win condition with uh, Narset, because if you activate it during your opponent's upkeep 
when you have a Nurset on the battlefield, uh, your opponent will draw a card and then discard a card, and then they'll skip their draw step. So if they're Hellbent, they just don't draw any more cards this game. Uh, Caleb misses his land again, is trying to go to his cleanup step. Uh, Patrick says, before you do, I'm going to flash in this 5-6, and I'm going to uh, draw another card off of this Azorius charm. Um, so at least Caleb now is going to have an opportunity to spend his mana as Patrick crunches in for 5, putting Caleb down to 15. Um, but Caleb is going to try to Trial of Ambition this, try to Dread Bore this, uh, some you know combination of removal spells to fight through this. And now Patrick can just spend his mana in his counter spells, um, protecting the Torrential Gearhulk, which he only needs to do uh, three more times before he's going to win the game. This is four mana. That is a Demonic Pact. Um, also, real attractive for Patrick, we have your opponent resolve a Demonic Pact when you have a bunch of counter magic up. Um, because however your opponent is trying to punish you with it, you have ways to interact with. Um, so he does let it resolve. But it is going to give Caleb quite a bit of card advantage over a couple turns. It's going to mind drop Patrick, then it's going to draw Caleb two cards. Actually, probably in the opposite order. Uh, here is a Teferi. So Teferi is going to come down and bounce the Demonic Pact. Um, we, Caleb and I had talked about that interaction before and how it's a big loss on tempo, but we decided that it's an acceptable inclusion because uh, if you now slam your Demonic Pact and then otherwise have a fair Teferi on Demonic Pact battle, the Demonic Pact is going to kill Teferi and then get you all sorts of card advantage back. Um, but that doesn't look like what's going to happen this game. Um, Caleb's going to have to cast some Dread Boars, and he's going to let Patrick either continue beating down with this Torrential Gearhulk, which only needs to hit twice more in order to win the game, uh, or he's going to let Patrick untap with two Teferis in play. Uh, neither of those, I think, are going to really give Caleb a chance to win this game. Uh, so it looks to me like we're going to be going to game two pretty shortly. Um, that did look like a Kaya's Wrath. I think that we don't have two black sources. Oh, we must. There must be an isolated chapel under that plains. Um, or under that clifftop retreat. So we either have one or zero red sources. Patrick says, that's fine. I can lose my six power. I'm going to untap with these two planeswalkers. Uh, and I agree. It's not going... It's going to be a, It's going to be pretty trivial for Patrick to win this game at this point. He's resolving an end of turn dig through time. So we got confirmation. That's two planes, one swamp, one chapel. So Caleb can't even cast the dread boar in his hand. Um, I think a red source got nipped off that field of run. So I'm uh, curious exactly what Caleb's mana was at the time. Um, Cause he does seem to have given up the opportunity to get a red source, but I guess he needed the second black source in order to unlock the demonic pact, which was his plan. Patrick's then going to tick up. He does look like he has the Narset, but his opponent's pretty far from Hellbent. Um, if I was Patrick, I would be activating this Castle Arden Veil vale and then untapping my Castle Arden Veil, vale, but Patrick wants to kill his opponent much faster. So he's going to play this Elspeth Suns Champion, tick this up to make three 1-1s, one -ones, and then he's still able to untap two lands, which can be an end-of-turn Arden Veil vale activation or potentially uh, a cancel and a two-mana counterspell at the same time, although... It doesn't look like Patrick has counterspells in his hand. I'm seeing Teferi, Cast Out, Detention Sphere, multiple Supreme Verdicts. Um, so I guess that's reasons, you know, not to take the Ardenvale play, like I had suggested, that Patrick doesn't actually have the way to protect his threats. If Caleb was able to cast two Dreadbores here because he had mana that allowed him to do that, that might actually be sufficient to get him out of this hole. But that is not where we're at. We're casting a 3-1 against a board that's going to make three 1-1s one every turn. Uh, and that is not going to hold up. If Caleb stops, uh, if Caleb passes the turn right now, uh, Patrick is going to end of turn, make another 1-1. One, one, crack in for 4. Oh, I, actually making the 1-1s one, probably got to be better than exiling the 3-1. Caleb at least has the opportunity to pick up a Shepherd of the Lost, but he just opts not to. Patrick is untapping. He drew a sensor, which actually can counter something this game. 
oh, right. Um, the Shepherd of the Lost's adventure ability is an instant, but there is a Teferi Time Raveler on the battlefield. So all of those instants have been uh, terminated, nipped. There's a sensor into a sensor into another Teferi. Uh, so we're going to take up this Elspeth. We're going to make three more 1-1s. One then we're going to crack in for three, putting Caleb down to six. And then we're going to be showing lethal next turn with two Teferis that can minus and remove um, blockers. Uh, Demonic Pact isn't going to get us anywhere because it's not going to activate before we untap. Uh, best case scenario, we're resolving a Kaya's Wrath here. But all of this looks uh, a lot like treading water. None of this really looks to me like it's going to get us out of this. I'm not quite sure what that white permanent Caleb just drew was. I think it's a Starfield of Nyx. Um, that card is here to end the game when you're ahead. It does not bail you out. We're going to gonna play that 3-1 again. Um, block it does not. We're going to fatal push a soldier token. Um, it feels arduous, painful, but it's something we got to do. All right. Hello, I'm sorry I'm late. That's quite all right. So we're being joined by your favorite, Alex Morris. Hello, hello. How's it going? What am I missing? Um, so just to catch you up, we're playing Blue White Control against the Mardu Doom Foretold uh, Demonic Pact deck. Okay. Uh, the short answer is, this is game one. Caleb has 20 removal spells in his deck and missed his fourth land for several turns. Okay, so we're getting slammed by Blue Eye Control. We're getting slammed by Blue Eye Control. Patrick has an Elspeth and two Teferis on the battlefield. Okay. Uh, so I, th I think we'll be looking at sideboards pretty soon. Yeah, that sounds right to me. So this matchup seems kind of rough for Caleb. It feels to me like if Caleb ever just tries to play the card Demonic Pact, that Patrick can probably just, like, morph his game plan around Caleb dying to his own Demonic Pact. And like, if you counter, like, two spells, like, he's probably gonna die to it, right? Uh, that's reasonable. The Demonic Pact does get to uh, Mind Rot Patrick. Yeah, uh, which, pretty relevant. Which does help. Um, and then Caleb has uh, probably around ten ways to get it off the battlefield between Shepherd of the Lost, Wishclaw Talisman, um, <laughs> yeah, ways and to find Foretold. It. Um, so there, Patrick does have to do some amount of work, uh, and Caleb has, I think, four Thoughtseize in the main board. I actually think they're duresses. Perfect. Doom Foretold. That will deal with these lethal tokens. Yeah, I don't think that one's going to work. Patrick's going to go ahead and read this one, see if he even cares enough to counter it. Uh, but Caleb tapped out. He's at one life. Patrick has eight, token, eight tokens on the battlefield, or maybe it's seven. Something, I, it, must, it must be five tokens on the, or eight tokens on the battlefield excuse me because uh caleb was at six and then went to one and then a plus from the elspeth makes three summoning sick tokens but regardless that's gonna do it for game number one let's take a look at patrick's sideboard patrick has two lyra donblinger one blessed alliance two nyx fleece ram two rest in peace two disdainful stroke three aether gust a piffing needle a mystical dispute and a cataclysmic gear hulk what sounds good here so what's actually really neat about caleb's deck is that it's a stack of enchantments and mm -hmm. we know Patrick has Detention Spheres and Cast Outs in his main board, but none of these cards meaningfully interact with enchantments. Agreed. Um, I like the Disdainful Strokes. It's going to hit the Blessed Alliance. It's also, going to hit the Demonic Pact. Yeah, it's going to hit your Doom Foretolds, all that type of thing. Um, the question is, do I play a Cataclysmic Gear Hulk? Because when Caleb has five enchantments on the battlefield, do I put him down to one? Um, but I'm inclined to say that you just don't. Yeah, it doesn't seem great to me. We have... Basically a whole bunch of bricks, Aether Gust, basically no targets, right? Pithing Needle, basically no targets. And then like Mystical Dispute, not a blue deck, Cataclysm Gear Hulk, something, and Nyx Fleece Ram, obviously not here, so like what's really Patrick's plan in a post board game? It's probably just gonna stay pretty similar to game one. I think you're priced in to bring me into Disdainful Stroke and the Mystical Dispute. I tend to um, agree. Because they do interact with your opponent. And you're gonna have too many dead cards. Right, and then the question is, do you have so many dead cards that you bring in Lyra and Cataclysmic Girl Hulk? And I think the answer is you don't. It's, it's gonna depend quite a bit on Patrick's actual configuration, but 
odds are you probably don't have that many dead cards because most of the like blue white controls removal spells are things like Teferi bounce at counter on the way back down or cards like cast out detention sphere that do end up interacting profitably with the rest of Caleb's permanence. And we know that Patrick is playing Azorius Charm and the gorgeous thing about that card is it's never dead. You can yep. cycle it. Always, always cyclable. So let's take a look at Caleb's sideboard over on Mardu Cat Pact. He's got two Elder Spell, one brought back, one Harmless Offering, two Angrath Rampage, one Bedevil, one Noxious Grasp, two Legion's End, two Abrade, and a Dreadbore. What well, sounds good here? Uh, the Elder Spell looks really good oh, on yeah. the battlefield that we just saw. Um, the Angrath Rampage, I think, is going to be similar because Patrick must be playing somewhere in the neighborhood of 10 Planeswalkers in his deck? That's pretty normal. You've usually got the four uh, small Teferis somewhere in the realm of three, four Narsets and then some of the bigger ones to try and end the game with. So a 10, maybe even 11 or 12, depending on configuration again. And you have Bedevil for the, the same purpose there. Um, we know he's got tr uh, Trial of Ambitions that he's dying to take out. Yeah, I get those he's out. He's got fatal pushes that he's dying get him to out, out yeah i'm a little disappointed because when caleb and i were talking about this deck 72 hours ago uh -huh. uh, there was a stack of sin collectors in the sideboard and they are not here now they are not here that's pretty notable um, i was so excited for him uh but this is where we're at i think that caleb has six trial of ambition slash fatal push um yeah. so with two elder spell two angrass rampage into the devil oh and a dread boar and a dread boar we're, we're doing all right so caleb's gonna find himself with uh, three, four, five, six, seven cards in his deck that say destroy target Planeswalker. Yeah, that's that's an interesting spot to be in because, it, you know, the nature of Planeswalkers is that once they've resolved, Patrick's going to activate them, and then if Caleb destroys them, Patrick will be ahead slightly because you're trading your Planeswalker for Caleb's card plus the activation and presumably a similar amount of mana when you look at, you know, like, like uh, the Elder Spell... Uh, Bedeviled particularly trades straight three mana for three mana with most of Patrick's Planeswalkers. And so you don't feel like that's a great plan, but it is a reasonable one to stop Patrick from pulling super far ahead if you can continue to present, present cards that generate repeated advantage and limit Patrick's ability to do so. Similarly, Noxious Grasp also actually, I believe, hits basically all of Patrick's Planeswalkers, except Narset, would only cost two mana. So that's going to be an interesting choice of whether Caleb, you know, wants to lend himself a little bit of uh, extra mana to play with for the, you know, lack of versatility that Noxious Grasp offers, and whether or not he just wants to bring all of it in. Right. Uh, I listed, I believe, six cards that were dead or if not out. quite dead. Caleb didn't want them. Um, we have to add Kaya's Wrath to that list. Uh, yeah. um, so he does have room to bring in Ashe's Wrath or maybe even something like Legion's End. I don't love Legion's End, that's for sure. Yeah, but when you've uh, Angrath yeah. rampaged away their Elspeth, the then, yeah, I guess, I guess it's it something, yeah. Just a two for one. <laughs> it feels like you're getting away with something when they resolve Elspeth. <laughs> Sometimes you combo off and are only down one card. Yeah, yeah not the worst. All right, well, let's take a look at opening hands here. Looks like Caleb's going to be on the play for game number two. We'll see what he's got to function with. Looks like land spells. I see Oath of Kaya. Um, is that a Fatal Push? Fatal Push still in the deck, notably, at the front of Caleb's hand there. Um, he did just get fancy FNM promo Fatal Pushes that he was very happy with. So uh, That makes sense to me, <laughs> but I don't know. With Fatal Push, Oath of Kaya, I think I'm going to send that one back. Like That's just none of the spells that I care about in this matchup. Even if I have the right number of lands, I think I'm going to need to want to do better than that. Patrick didn't get a good look at his hand, but uh, I think he'd be shuffling by now if he was unhappy with it. So assume that that'll be a keep on his end. I saw a bunch of lands in a detention sphere. Sounds good to me, I think. Uh, you do want something proactive to do? Aww. Yeah. Oh. Oh, hi, Ma. Excellent. Ah, yes, he's, he's on camera. I thought he was saying something cute when I started to see hi, and then I saw he <laughs> kept writing and feared the worst. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so Caleb going to take a look at his six here. Yeah, it looks like five lands cast out detention sphere, I think, is Patrick's hand. I, that might have been a searcher's canta. Search for Kanta? That's that hand's really good if that's true. That also looked like a forest, so I I think yeah, I'm, I think I'm, I'm just not, missing I'm something. Sure, I'm not sure. All right, so we've got lands. Looks like three in the colors. There's a dreadbore and a wishclaw yeah. talisman. 
It looks pretty good to me is at a, a glance. Is that that he's... Oh, putting on the bottom? I yeah. No I think he put Oath of Kaya on the bottom of his deck, if I'm not crazy. Is that... Yeah, Dread Boar. So it looks like we're going to start at 18 and cast Duress. Is this a main board Duress? Yes, he does main board for Duresses. Why uh, that instead of Thoughtseize? Uh, the answer is entirely budget. Um, Got it. We typically play standard on Fridays, uh, and we told everyone, hey, you have to play Pioneer. Uh, and so they did. To their credit, I think there's 21 people in this event, which yeah, is more than we've had for people are stoked about in a while. Pioneer, yeah. Um, but you, there's a lot of uh, like mana bases that are a little shoddy and yeah. decks that aren't quite filled out the way that you want them to be. Which yet. is an excellent time to mention that if you are looking to play Pioneer and haven't gotten into it yet, this might be the place because for that exact reason, you're not going to be too worried about, you know, going up and just getting slammed by everybody with tier one decks. That doesn't mean that they aren't here and that you aren't going to get, uh, you know, an adequate level of competition. I know a few of uh, friends of mine are here and they're you know, they've got their real decks, they're here to, you know, they're here to crush, win some store credits, smash some people, but, you know, this is definitely a good place to come start playing Pioneer if you haven't gotten the chance to yet. Yeah, between the owners and uh, employees, uh, they managed to put together, I think it's eight decks that are not being played by the person who built them, so we've had a ton of people in the room yeah. today that just showed up and, excuse me, just showed up and were handed a deck, uh, and if you want that to be you, just message us on facebook let us know so yep. that we can make sure we have enough um but we're happy to get people playing this format we're Definitely. doing it again next friday super nice yeah and this is of course all in preparation for that pioneer 1k we have on december 14th so i know i'm gonna be looking forward to that i'm sure you are as well oh, and a yeah. bunch of the bunch of the locals here as well as the like seattle grinders uh have already mentioned that they'll definitely be coming up for this because people are looking for places to play pioneer regardless let's uh take a step back go back to the match here we've got wish talisman on the board for caleb patrick with an narset is gonna get oath of kayad here so that narset minus and found a blessed alliance which yeah. means blessed alliance is still in patrick's deck yeah i mean it's got what the modes are sacred attacking creature Gain, gain four life, life. or and, untap two creatures. Yeah, uh, I mean it's gaining four life every game, right? Like I, I don't know what that card's doing in our deck. I think we found a, a situation in a matchup where um, we just don't have enough um, cards to take out sounds to right. bring in. Um, which is, you know, that's kind of the mistake you never make at a Grand Prix, but you absolutely make it your first FNM playing a deck. Definitely, definitely. So, we've got Isolated Chapel here from Caleb. We're still thinking on this Wishclaw Talisman, yet to activate it. So this deck has a couple tricks with Wishclaw Talisman. Um, I know it was on the, on the thing by the screen, but we didn't talk about it when it was there. Um, but Wishclaw Talisman, uh, you Demonic Tutor, but then you give the Talisman to your opponent. Indeed. And the ways Caleb has to break that is, uh, one, if Caleb tutors for a Doom Foretold... Yeah, I was going to mention that. ...cast the Doom Foretold, Patrick has to decide to sack the Wishclaw Talisman uh, or to activate it, give the Talisman back to Caleb... And then let the Doom Foretold go off, yeah. essentially. And the other thing is, if Caleb has a Shepherd of the Flock in his hand, which he's playing Ooh, four of, like that. you can activate the Wishclaw Talisman and then respond to the activation by picking up the Wishclaw Talisman. That's pretty cute. Also, if Caleb got priced into bringing in Ingress Rampages and Abrades and what have you, yeah, you can and even... he's just stuck with one of them in his hand, um, he could tutor for a Demonic Pact or a Duress and then use his card that's not otherwise relevant to destroy the Wishclaw Talisman. Definitely. So... Looks like both players kind of just biding their time right now. Patrick going to end step a field of ruin, just destroy a random sacred foundry. And, you know, I can't help but feel like this sort of stalemate is got to be benefiting Patrick. Uh, yeah, Caleb does have a whole mess of uh, four mana enchantments. <laughs> yeah. So getting into a situation where he has a bunch of mana and can resolve multiple things is fine. Um, Patrick has not done very much in the way of drawing Playing cards anything yeah it's... so until he starts getting his two for ones which i guess narset kind of was if blessed alliance counts as the card that he's advantaged yeah i don't think it does <laughs> um but until he's you know drawing cards or generating some sort of advantage Ooh. caleb's not that far behind all right so full stop here game mode game turned around demonic pact has hit the battlefield and now the whole game's going to revolve around demonic pact so Looks like, let's see what Patrick wants to do. End step, go ahead and cast a Torrential Gear Hulk, flashing back Hieroglyphic Illumination, draw two cards. 
we see Caleb looks at Patrick's hand and he knows he has plenty of ways to deal with this demonic pact. The real question is, is Patrick just going to fire one off? And it looks like the answer is yes. He's just going to no nonsense, get this demonic pact off the board. I don't want to deal with it. I think I agree with Patrick here. Uh, your opponent's been doing a whole lot of nothing all game. He's probably just sitting on lands or spells that he can't or doesn't want to cast. Um, and so I think just cutting off his avenues to drawing into more relevant action seemed pretty good. Yeah, and I said uh, Patrick's not getting ahead until he starts drawing cards. Well, end of turn 5-6 Mole Drifter is... <laughs> yeah, that'll do, yeah. So here's a Kaya's Wrath. That's another one that Caleb still has in his deck, but, you know, pretty inefficient answer to that Torrential Gear Hulk, but he does elect to keep the Dreadbore back in his hand. Seems pretty good to me. Looks like we're going to see a cycle on an irrigated farmland. End of turn from Patrick. Untap and draw Teferi and Lyra were the two hits. Hello. Those seem pretty good. That, uh, absolutely. Teferi is back in the format. Um, He is definitely one of the things you have to be aware of when you're building a deck in this format. Yeah. Is that if you leave your blue-white control player unmolested because you don't want to commit into a supreme verdict or what have you yeah, at five just... mana they can slam a teferi they can take him up they can draw a card they can get back the mana to cast azorius a disdainful charm. stroke azorius charm which he just drew off yeah of teferi. which is kind of becoming the like classic in pioneer now it's like you know back in standard you'd have oh teferi plus and then cast he didn't mortify or whatever. Seal away was Seal the Seal away was the, the really the one that most people talked about on five, and that was like the nuts. It's like, how am I ever beating this? Now it's a lot of, you know, Teferi plus Azorius Charm, and that's even more versatile. And here we see Azorius Charm in response to a Dreadbore looking for a counterspell. Does not find one. Dreadbore takes down Teferi. Here's another demonic pact. Patrick cycles irrigated farmland. It will resolve. And now Patrick's going to need to find an answer to this Demonic Pact once again. I think he has a Teferi for three mana in his hand. He does. So we'll go ahead and return Demonic Pact to Caleb's hand. Draw a card. Settle the Wreckage off the top. That's another one that's still in Patrick's stack that he's definitely not going to be super happy to see. <laughs> Caleb is down to just that Demonic Pact as the only card in his hand. Yeah. Um... You might have to use this Wish Claw Talisman, but I feel like once you do that, you're putting yourself pretty far behind. Yeah, but you it's need rough. to answer the Teferi. You don't need to answer the Teferi. You need to answer the Lyra, probably now. So I want yeah. to resolve this Demonic Pact, activate my Wish Claw Talisman. Oh, that's he a spell He drew Bedevil, in his hand? correct. So Bedevil does get to take out the Lyra. That's a pretty reasonable draw here. Now we'll see it back over to Patrick. Patrick needs to find another answer for Demonic Pact. Otherwise, Caleb's going to get to draw some extra cards. Uh, and we said... Oh, fairy. We said we're not sure if that uh, Blessed Alliance counts as a card. Uh, but when you have to... When you get mind rotted... It does. you discard your Blessed Alliance, they don't care what it says it's true. on it. It's, it's a true. card. Very true. So here's Teferi. Teferi's going to tuck the Demonic Pact. And now we see the Teferi gang. And uh, these are usually the board states that uh, people complain about. <laughs> you know, it's just, you can't interact. What are you supposed to do? How am I ever beating this? And to be honest, I don't think Caleb really can come back from this. Unless he's got something insane in his deck that he can go Wish Claw Talisman for. Even that, like, I, I can't think of what would even be the most absurd card for Caleb to go get. Like, I mean, it would have planar to be... Planar Cleansing? Planar Cleansing, you're still so far behind. I don't know. Planar Cleansing, you get rid of the Wish Claw Talisman, you get rid of both the Teferis, you get yeah. your Demonic Pact back. Oh, that's true. You do get a Demonic Pact back. So, like, that's kind of as close as I can imagine us getting. But uh, even that, I mean, I don't think that Caleb does actually have Planar Cleansing. It he seems somewhat not. unlikely. Have, yeah. Yeah. And it would be Hour of Revelation. If uh, anything, yeah. Right. So. So, Patrick... Uh, I, I was thinking, you know, maybe he's got the two Teferis, all he's missing is the Elspeth. Um, but he got to end of turn Hieroglyphic Illumination, untap, draw a card, dig through time. So, yeah. like, if I have a threat that's going to win me the game in the top 12 cards of my library... I'm going to find it. Yeah, and, and even if <laughs> you don't find a threat that's going to win you the game in the top 12 is. cards of your library... Uh, Teferi will just plus and win you the game eventually. You know, eventually Teferi Ultimate will win you the game. So, uh, here comes Elspeth. Uh, 
Caleb's Demonic Pact one more card down. So he's going to need this top card to be kind of a haymaker here. Let's see what it is. It's a land. I think that's probably going to spell uh, the end the end times here for Caleb. I, I talked about how it was going to be pretty much impossible to come back earlier, but now I think the door is just completely shut. Uh, I There's a Demonic Pact on top of his deck, and Patrick doesn't even have to care about it, you know? Uh, I don't know what kind of cancels Patrick has in his deck. His deck is called Mono Counters, but it's clearly, you know, tap out <laughs> control. Yeah. So that's, that de that name is there to put fear into the heart of your enemy. Another subtle wreckage. Um, but if you have a cancel anywhere in your deck, then you don't care about with this Wishclaw Talisman. Yep. If you do care about this Wishclaw Talisman, you can just go answer it. Yeah, here's Patrick just on, on my end of turn with the Teferi trigger on the stack. I'm just going to cast Blessed Alliance and gain four life. Whatever. Whatever you got to do. <laughs> All right. Caleb's looking at the top card. This is the demonic pact too, right? Oh. Do we know that? Oh, we don't. It, no, we do know that, but it looks like Patrick just doesn't want Caleb to draw a demonic pact. So he's going to go ahead and field of ruin Caleb in his upkeep so that Caleb does not get access to that powerful enchantment. Seems fine to me. I mean, honestly, I think if your opponent just like slams a demonic pact, then you're not even worried about it anyway, but, but... In that reality, you at least have to minus your Planeswalker on the Demonic Pact. And I guess we... Yeah, it's it's probably... It's definitely one of the better cards in Caleb's deck, but even then, it, it feels like... Demo like, Demonic Pact doesn't have an effect until the next turn for Caleb, right? So, I honestly think if I was Patrick, I'd just let him have it. <laughs> yeah, um, I do want to talk about the Field of Ruin interaction. Um, your opponent has to search their library. They don't have to Indeed. find a land, of course, um, but the shuff shuffling is not optional with that one. Yeah, so Caleb is forced to shuffle away his Demonic Pact. Let's see what he found on top of his deck. Looks like Wishclaw Talisman's gonna go digging now. You can so, have that. Yeah. I'm gonna pray just a little bit. Maybe something's see in here we that got. I didn't put there. Caleb's looking. Duress. It's a reasonable start, I suppose. If we drew a big haymaker this turn, but I didn't quite see what we drew. I think Caleb drew Kaya's Wrath, if I have to guess. I think Doom Foretold is our best bet here. It's not a great one, but it's the best thing we've got going on. Yeah, is that a That's a Starfield, Starfield of Nyx. Starfield of Nyx? That one doesn't seem too bad. Uh I don't, we don't he actually have, have enchantments in, in our graveyard. graveyard. Oh no. They all got put into his hand and library. Yikes. Yeah, let's see if he can find anything that looks good. Oath of Kaya to take out Big Teferi. That's reasonable, but doesn't deal with Elspeth. And <laughs> it's rare that you find yourself in a board state where Teferi isn't the biggest problem. Uh, but I think we're here, <laughs> and, and the bigger problem is Elspeth. Uh, Elspeth is just going to kill us. At least, you know, if our opponent has two Teferis, we can hope that their hand is just all lands or something. But, like, if they have an Elspeth, we are just going to die. <laughs> Um, so, Caleb found the Dreadbore, which is going to be able to kill an Elspeth. Yep. Um, but it gave Patrick a Demonic Tutor. Wishclaw Talisman. So Patrick's going to get to do something if he chooses to. Like, Indeed. Wishclaw Talisman for Elspeth, slam Elspeth, minus my giant Teferi to get rid of your Wishclaw Talisman. Definitely. It, it's not a particularly winning proposition. Oh, he's got an Oath of Kaya and a Dreadbore? Um, mayhaps, mayhaps. So here comes Oath of Kaya. We'll see if Patrick even cares. Um, although I don't actually think Patrick has a counterspell in his hand. So Oath of Kaya will take out Teferi. Mono Counters is a baller name for that deck. He had me. Yeah, he's <laughs> <laughs> I think he's. I think he's just boldface lying to us. Well, the counters are loyalty counters. Oh not yes, counters yes, spells. that makes sense. That makes sense. All right, and here is Kaya's Wrath. So we must have tutored for Oath of Kaya, or. Kaya's Wrath. I guess in this case it killed the Teferi that we wanted killed anyway, so we might as well gain three life. <laughs> Did Patrick just cast Supreme Verdict in response? <laughs> 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 okay, well, a little, little bit of BM there from Patrick. Sometimes it's like that, yeah. Yeah, alright. So here comes Castle Vantress. Castle Vantress is going to scry two to the bottom. <laughs> and... Let's see what Patrick wants. Patrick's just going to go ahead and give his opponent back the Wishclaw Talisman. Just no fear. I wonder what he's going to find. If I was Patrick, I'd just find a counterspell. You don't even have to show it to your opponent. Like, you could just, just get a cancel. Any cancel, you know? It doesn't matter know what it is. I don't know if he has one. They're not super playable. 
Yeah, they they really aren't. Like the best one is absorb. And there's like some sinister sabotages you can float around somewhere in there, but for the most part you just put cards like syncopate. Uh, I've seen some Dobin's vetoes floating around. I've seen a couple void shatters Oof, in the room. Void shatter. Uh, Cuz there's, there's a bunch of mystical dispute. Yeah, that if means, you don't want to get your canceled mystical disputed, your dissipate mystical I buy disputed. I buy that. All right. I think Patrick searched for Lyra Dawnbringer. That seems a little dubious. Yeah, I'm not crazy about this. This just doesn't seem like really the path that you need to be taking. You know, like, now we gave our opponent back their Wish Claw Talisman. He gets to activate it. Of course, that will remove the third counter. So Caleb can basically just activate it freely. And you can just, like, go grab another Wrath of God or something if he needs to or whatever and deal with the Elspeth tokens too. It just doesn't feel like Lyra's the particular axis that Patrick needed to fight on here. But uh, also... Patrick can't go find another Elspeth. That's not going to get him here. Yeah. What? So your other option is Castle Ardenvale? Uh, like, if you're looking if for we, a way yeah. to end the game. I mean, I mean had, Aetherling would be sweet, but I haven't seen that card in this yeah, format yet. I mean, I mean, if we had any t type of counter magic, I would have preferred that. And potentially, I would have just preferred no activation, even even over, I think, Fine Lyra. Fine Lyra just doesn't seem impactful. Like, your opponents showed you that they still have Wraths in their deck. But she brings the Dawn. True, true. Perhaps Caleb does not have any more Wraths in his deck. We've seen, what, two already? Or just one, maybe? Something like that. Uh, looks like Caleb will go ahead and find Dreadboard this time. Which, I guess, is uh, another good reason to not have consumed your Dreadboard earlier when uh, Oath of Kaya does the job. Does the job. You have more Dreadboards to go yeah, find. Definitely. So here is Dreadboard at Elspeth. It resolves... Patrick will go ahead and scry to top and bottom. And now we're going to attack for eight. Yeah, it's a lot. Caleb left with no cards in hand. He drew a land for his turn, unfortunately. Caleb, uh, the good old case of draw no lands game one, draw all lands game two. <laughs> I mean, Caleb played several relevant spells this game. Also true. He just got them all shuffled back into his library. Yeah, definitely true. So... There's the attack for eight. Patrick did draw Absorb for turn, notably. So I think that is, uh, you know, Caleb with no cards in, in hand. Obviously, I think that one's going to do the trick. Even if he draws the best spell in his deck right now, as long as it doesn't say can't be countered, then it is going to be no good. Fatal Push, a token. And there goes the handshake. Patrick will take down Caleb in a clean two-game series in the first round of the night. So not bad. Yeah, uh, looks like it took... Most of the round, so it's pretty unlikely that we um, get anyone else on camera. Although I know a couple people showed up to the tournament late. Um, I don't want to get them on camera because I want to give them as much time to uh, end their round so we can start the next one. Agreed. Um, but it's possible that we'll move another game that's uh, going to game three there because if uh, the round's going to go five or ten minutes late, I don't know if they got a time extension. So we'll look into that. Yeah, we'll see. Um, but before that, we want to talk about one of our buddies here. Yes, we'd love to talk about Advanceify. Advanceify is the best IT web design and data recovery company in the area. If you're in need of anything tech-related, IT, web design, anything like that, head over to www.advanceify.me and let them know that we sent you over there. And uh, thank you so much to Advanceify for sponsoring the stream. Without their help, we couldn't be here. We couldn't bring you guys all of this content. So thank you, Advanceify, and go check them out. They really do great things. Uh, uh, with that... I believe we will be cutting to some music and a quick commercial, and we will be seeing if we have anything for you in the rest of this round. But if not, we'll be back for round number two, so make sure not to go anywhere. We'll be right back. Here's Hot Damn Scandal.
The bottom fell out of the clouds today And the rain came down like a mirror One big sheet and it shattered on the ground Now it's seven years of bad luck all over this town mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It's collection time on all of your debts And you can't get by just talking Your smile don't work and your car don't start And your doors ain't keeping you alone No, not even if you lock them No, not even if you lock them When you're tapped into that bit of pain, just about anything feels good. Shining on a lost boy's eyes, they reflected all so pretty. But it's cold behind them golden shores, and the sweet light wasn't nothing more than their own damn wishing. Cause they just don't listen. Now wish on your candles, pray to your God, cry for your mama, put a dollar on the bar. It feels like breathing, but the only good feeling ain't a gimbal is a sin. So I think I'll play it safe and get a gin. I'll take the devil for a spin. When you're tapped into that video. About anything feels good. For some, the morning brings another day, but all it does for me is shine an ugly light around in the room that I've been hiding in. Now I take the It's harder every day, but I ain't here to fix myself. I'm just trying to blind these eyes from hell. When you're tapped into that bit of pain, just about anything. of the barrel I like to sleep in hidey holes and barroom stalls I like to hear the piano playing in the bloody little dawn I like to wake up with the devil and drink him till he's gone the queen is drunk and someone armed the poor
Hello, everybody, and welcome back to round number two here at the Paradise Games Friday Night Pioneer event. We've got Dylan versus Nick in the booth uh, to, for this round, excuse me. So uh, we've got a nice little uh, Mardu Prison Doom for Told deck over on Dylan's side versus some Atarka Red. So uh, you had a pretty big hand in this uh, Mardu deck on the left here with the Dylan's piloting. Why don't you go ahead and uh, give us the rundown on that one? All right, so this one's like the Esper Stacks decks that you see in Standard in that it plays a bunch of cantripping artifacts. Um, to take advantage of the cantripping artifacts, you have a few more tools. Um, you have Hidden Stockpile to make 1-1s one every time you revolt, and then you have uh, Gear Reaper Aether Grid to tap all your things to chip Ping away at your opponent's creatures. Yeah. Um, you have a suite of removal spells, uh, Fatal Pushes, Sweltering Suns, um, Oath of Kaya. Yep. And then uh, you've got two Herald of Anguish and two uh, six mana Oath of the Gatewatch Chandra Flamecaller. Yes, caller, Chandra Flamecaller. Uh, as your ways to finish off the game. Seems pretty good, but uh, here we see Dylan cracking his Evolving Wilds, finding a mountain up against Nick. Turn one stomping ground uh, Monastery Swift Spear. That's, that's going to be not exactly what Dylan wanted to see, I don't think. Um, I asked Nick, uh, are you playing Burning Tree Emissary? And his response... Or sorry, uh, yeah, so Burning Tree Emissary. And his response was, no, that's two mana. <laughs> <laughs> Alright, well, Swift Spear, here's an untapped Stomping Ground. Or is that a Rugged Highlands? I believe that's a Rugged Highlands, actually. I think that's the name of that one. I think that's a Rootbound Crag. Rootbound Crag. Rugged Highlands Rootbound would have Crag. entered tapped. Yeah, 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 yeah. That's, I'm getting the name confused. So here's just a Good old Atarchus Command. Attack. Gas the Atarchus Command. Dylan gets hit for a bunch. Six. Yeah. Um, the obvious mo modes apply there. I mean, Atarchus Command uh, technically has four modes, but that, that card only has two modes. <laughs> I could imagine, uh, like, the 
team area reclamation decks, a build of them that cycle through your library multiple times, using a target's command as both an explorer and the way to win the game when you uh, Ooh, cycle through your deck multiple that times. That sounds fun. Uh, yeah, but I, when you start letting me build decks for you, you end up with uh, like mana bases of four evolving wilds and six each of your three basics, so we should probably ignore the thought and go back to the prophetic prism that's on the battlefield. Yeah, and here is... It's a um, lightning another, strike. Another burn spell getting pointed at Dylan. Soul Scar Mage to follow it up. Here's an attack for two. Should put Dylan down to eight, if my math is correct. So if we don't have a Slag Storm, sorry, a Sweltering Suns or an Oath of Kaya here, we're I think we're going to find ourselves in some trouble. Yeah, so here is four mana. Oh, Battle at the Bridge. For battle at the Bridge. <laughs> for five. For so five. we're going to give yep. this creature minus five, minus five. And gain five gain life. Five life. Oh, it looks like that wasn't a lightning oh, strike. Oh, invigorated rampage. Choose one target creature gets plus four plus zero oh, and gets trample until end of turn. Two target creatures get plus two plus zero oh, and gets trample. Okay, so that was uh, effectively a four damage spell instead of a three damage spell. So it would have put Dylan down to seven instead of eight. Um, and then here is the five life off battle at the bridge, going back up to twelve. Stomping ground enters the battlefield untapped, which you hate sitting across the yeah. table from. Yeah. <laughs> oh, so here's oh, the thing. So you're gonna want to get in the habit if you're playing Abbot again of not playing your land before your Abbot. Yes, absolutely. Definitely matters. Abbot, of course, in this this case only finds the wild slash, so not not punished. Although. Nick does get a little punished for casting the Wild Slash before he cast his Monastery Swift Spear, so a little bit of missequencing here, but unless Dylan has a pretty powerful next turn here, Nick's probably going to be able to find lethal because I believe he has a spell left in his hand, and I think basically any spell is going to be lethal on this board. So, um, that is a hidden stockpile, which is going to make us a chum blocker, and then I assume we're going to eat this food and go... Yeah, I, life total can't still be seven, right? Because uh, cool, we gained well, life off the battle of the bridge. We gained life off the battle, and then we took two from a wild slash, two from a monastery swift spear, one from a monastery swift spear. So yeah, I actually think that seven is correct. Okay. That so we're going to gain three off the golden egg, go to ten, make a one-one blocker. So the way Nicholas played his last turn, uh, by playing the land first and then the abbot and then casting the spell, um, I suspect that he thinks you need to resolve the spell as part of the resolution of abbot's ability. That is kind of my inclination as well. So we'll uh, we'll definitely clear that up for him after the round. Yes, um, yes. But so many people in this room are seeing cards for the first time. A Tarka's Command off the top. That's the that's a good one here. Yeah, so that is effectively and teamer do battle rage. Five oh boy. damage. Oh boy. Oh. I think uh, Dylan's got to be dead, right? Like a Tarka's oh. Command teamer battle rage. He's got to be. Yeah. Turn him sideways. Block here. Point my pump spells. I think a fatal push maybe gets us out of it. Yeah, that that would do it. So here's three damage to you, plus one, plus one, to a creature. <laughs> Instead, we're going to sack our thing so you trample in for even more. Yeah, <laughs> but of course... So we're going to seven, and that's four yeah. power, and then and we're going to teamer the battle, rage, battle rage, we're going to make that habit. exactly seven power. Yep, and that ought to be lethal, and it is, and... Nick cleans up game one here pretty handily with a nice little Tarkus Command Team or Battle Rage turn. Let's take a look at the sideboards for these players. Dylan has two Graft Digger's Cage, two Wear Tear, two D Spark, three Sin Collector, one Sweltering Suns, one Crypt Incursion, two Blood Baron of Viscopa, and two Battle at the Bridge. What sounds good to you here? Well, when we asked Dylan what the name of his deck was, he said Blood Baron Control, and there aren't any Blood Barons in his main board, um, so he's <laughs> clearly <laughs> here with a plan. Yeah, and cue and a burn, I think these Blood Barons are coming in. So I think we're going to see the Blood Barons, I think we're going to see the Battle at the Bridges. Certainly. I think we're going to see the Sweltering Suns. Crypt Incursion? Uh, Crypt Incursion is definitely interesting, it gains you a bunch of life if you get there. Um, I'm wondering, since we're bringing in the battles, if we're going to take out the Herald of Anguishes and the Chandras. Because, um, like, Dylan's deck is full of air, but you need this critical mass Something. of air in order yeah. to make your, your, your cards function. Work. Yeah. Um, you can't cut Prophetic Prism, not with that mana base. I agree. Yeah. So we'll have to see what a uh, fun sideboarding Dylan manages to do. Nick, on the other hand, has three Tormod's Crypt, two Abraid, two Renning Volley, and a Resolute Rider. Pretty uh, easy. It looks like it's a little short of 15. Also, Resolute Rider isn't castable with this mana base? Uh, I tend to agree. <laughs> oh, it's the green <laughs> or, black I'm, one. I'm so not... You can cast it with triple green. I'm not certain. Like, it, it, I, th I believe it is technically castable. Um, 
Is so, Resolute Rider the red, red, white one? Oh, I thought that it was I think the that, black one. No, that's Deathless Knight, I believe. Uh. I believe that Resolute Rider is the red, white one. Um, and for those of you who aren't wondering, Resolute Rider, and I believe that Resolute Rider is the uh, red, white, uh, four red, white hybrid uncommon from Throne of Eldraine that is a 2-3 with double strike that has four red, white hybrid as an activated ability to give it plus one, plus one until end of turn. Oh, uh, that makes sense. I believe is that card. Um, as a standalone threat, uh, that's pretty decent. Although I'd you know rather see like a Boros Reckoner or something in that spot. Yeah, I tend to agree. I don't think it's particularly close to the best card that Nick could have in his sideboard, but it is an extra threat. And if you find yourself going into a postboard game where you require extra threats, and it could also be good in the creature matchups as well. So, I don't hate it. Um, so I, having complete information. Um, I would consider bringing in Rending Volley, and I would not bring in a Braid. But having seen what Nick saw, I would consider bringing in a Braid, and I would not bring in Rending Volley. Yeah, that sounds right to me. Um, so, obviously, it's a little awkward, because whenever you sideboard, uh, you're always sideboarding against your opponent's sideboarded deck. And so, that leads to a lot of interesting discussions, where I feel like one of the sentences I say most uh, when discussing cards that are good in you know games of magic especially against the more linear decks is that sounds like that would be great against their game one plan uh and that usually means that decks have a better a better slash different plan in a post board game than they do in their first game and i think dylan's deck is definitely one of those dylan's game one plan i expect to be basically non-existent and he's going to be all about these blood baron of his copas trying to win the game for him battle at the bridges for large life total swings that type of thing he's up to four battle at the bridge for game two yeah days. that's a lot so looks like dylan's going to take a mulligan here at the start of the second game and nick taking a look at his opening hand looks like nick's gonna keep it looks like creature i think i saw on a tarkus command lands and spells so seems like a good keep to me Ah, Nick's deck needs Destructive Revelries. We'll have to suggest that to him. Destructive Revelry seems quite good in this matchup, I would say. Uh, so here's Hidden Stockpile. Couple lands. Looks like Swamp Plains. Swamp going on the bottom. I see a Renegade map as well. So that will be the first play. Swamp and a Renegade map. Abbot of Carol Keep off the top for Nick. Here's a Stomping Ground untapped, followed by a Monastery Swift Spear, putting the life totals down to 18 and 19, respectively draw for Dylan is Prophetic Prism. I'd be kind of surprised if we saw anything else here on the second turn of the game. He has a Hidden Stockpile, and Renegade Map into Hidden Stockpile is basically well, that pretty the good. only way yeah. to get the Revolt Trigger on turn two. Okay, so another Stomping Ground here for Nick. Collision Colossus pulled to the front of his hand here. Uh, we also have... Oh, I didn't get a great look at any of the other cards, so we'll see what's going on. Looks like here's an attack, and after no blocks, here is Colossus, my uh, Monastery Swift Spear. So this is going to be an attack for six. six, putting Dylan down to 13. This attack of red deck is just full of spells that just chunk you for four. It's ridiculous. <laughs> yeah, yeah, at least four, looking at you, Atarka's Command. Yeah. <laughs> so we've got uh, Renegade Map activation. Going to go find a mountain. Dylan's tapping three mana here for Oath of Kaya to take out that Monastery Swift Spear, and notably if Dylan had cast his uh, his Hidden Stockpile on the last turn, assuming that he didn't need to go crack the Renegade map for that land, he would be in a better spot here, but I don't actually see another land in his hand, so it looks like he might have been thinking towards the future with that play last turn. It is an option to crack your Renegade map for a mountain and put it in your hand, and then play your planes and cast your Hidden Stockpile. Definitely, definitely. Alright, so we've got <coughs> Dreadhorde Arcanist here from Nick, and then he's going to send the turn back over to Dylan. So we don't have any shocks or wild slashes or crash throughs or anything to that effect uh, in the graveyard right now. Yep. And it's still going to be enough for Dylan to just pull the trigger on a Sweltering Suns. And it was going to be very hard for Nick to, you know, flash back a Collision Colossus there. Uh, CMC of four, right? Yeah, that is correct? true. The card uh, does have a CMC of four. But then you see, like, he has... Collision Colossus. He has yeah, Titan Strength. He would have um, needed. Maybe him. there's Become Immense in that deck, and any Definitely. of those cards will get him there. And that's pretty scary. I mean, by the point that you're flashing back Collision Colossus, uh, you're probably taking ten if you're Dylan. So I understand the uh, kind of the 
immediate knee-jerk reaction there of get this thing off the battlefield. Speaking of which, here's Collision Colossus off the top. Of course, Abbot of Carol Keep came down last turn, so Nick doing a good job of keeping himself with prowess creatures in play. Looks like that will be the turn. Here's another attack for seven. So it looks to me like... I don't, I'm not sure how that Evolving Wilds got on the battlefield for Dylan. Uh, Nick's missed a good few land drops here. Yeah, but we went turn three, Oath of Kaya. And then turn oh, no. four. And then turn four, Prophetic Prism Hidden uh, Stockpile? Yeah. and the, Or there was a Sweltering Suns in there after oh, that. So you're turn right. four, That's Sweltering Suns. Turn five, Hidden Stockpile plus uh, Prophetic Prism and, and Evolving Wilds. Here's Oath of Kaya to take out Abbot of Carol Keep, putting Dylan back up to 12. Uh, and here is a 1-1 one, one from the Hidden Stockpile, because his other Oath of Kaya, of course, left the battlefield. Soul Scar Mage off the top. Looks like he's just going to send it right on back. Nick's hand flooded with plenty of cards that need him to have creatures in play, but he doesn't actually have very many creatures to really do the things with, nor the lands to deploy all of his spells quickly. So we'll see if he manages to find a way to end up deploying his spells in a meaningful time, or if Dylan's double hidden stockpile draw is just going to run away with the game. Yeah, with three servitors on the battlefield now, Dylan's going to be able to scry quite a bit, and he's going to be able to block every attack that Nyx makes. Yep. Uh, I would say for the rest of the game, but maybe the board state gets flooded. Um, but if Nick manages to create a giant trampling, double-striking threat, um, Dylan's not going to throw three bodies in front of the Soulscar Mage. Yeah, and um, he could just die. So you can make a seven-power dude with trample and double-strike and just, kill Dylan in one swoop. But we will need to see a few more lands here first so so ideally we block and then scry looks like that will be dylan's plan so here is block with a single creature from dylan nick will go ahead and give it plus four plus oh and trample and then dylan will elect that he wants to scry instead of saving the one life point so he's gonna take seven just yep. from that going to five yeah one uh, more of those five uh six correct that's a soul scar mage not an abbot of carol keep oh so he's taking six okay yeah, he's taking six um, here's Hidden Stockpile number three from Dylan. And Sweltering Suns to clean up the board. So we missed a combat step. And <clears throat> that kind of isn't what Dylan is about. It doesn't matter um, too much. But, but that is how you end the game. Like, you're a gear up or Aether Grid deck. Um, he might not have Chandra's or Herald of, Herald of Anguishes in his deck post board. Um, so it very well could matter. Yeah, Blood Baron too. You'd rather just be able to... You'd really much rather... You know, when you feel like you have the Blood Baron of his Copa online, you feel like you can't lose, but you still don't want to give him another turn or whatever, right? Like, you'd like to do that. Also, notably, Dylan went ahead and cracked his Evolving Wilds now, which he didn't need to do. He did have a Servo leave the turn, so he could have just saved the Evolving Wilds to get a guaranteed triple hidden stockpile uh, on a later turn, but what? it looks like he went ahead and cracked it then. It looks like he knew he was going to scry because he wanted to find something to do. Makes sense. And so if you're going to get the revolt, you might as well have the mana. Yeah. So here is a Doom Foretold from Dylan. Here's a Tark's Command end step to just fire it off, put Dylan to three. And now we're at the point where Nick's probably untapping with lethal here, right? So that felt like a miss to me because Nick had the opportunity to include the you can't gain life mode during his upkeep in response to the doom foretold. Um, but now I think he's not going to get that opportunity. Definitely true. When I saw Nick fire off that, yeah, <laughs> I think he just has another one. Yeah. And Dylan's like, oh. Yep. And that'll do it. Okay. Yep. Just a nice end step, burn spell, untap, burn spell, just like the good old days. In response to your Doom Foretold trigger, Kill classic you. play. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and the hits don't stop coming. Uh, that was real fast. Uh, yeah, I bet we'll be able to find a match to stick on camera here. Uh, I'm pretty confident. Um, but before we do that, uh, I want to tell you a little bit about uh, us. Um, yes, please do. Yeah, so we are Paradise Games. Um, we are here on Twitch on Fridays and Mondays. Um, if you're watching us on Twitch, thank you so much. Um follow us so we can give you an announcement every time we're going to go live so you remember. Uh, if you're watching us on YouTube, then watch us on Twitch. We're twitch.tv slash paradise underscore games, and we are uh, YouTube channel Paradise Games with an apostrophe after the O. Um, this is our website. We operate a TCG player store. If you ever want to support us, you can go to http colon slash slash www.paradise.games. <laughs> right? 
Uh, and yeah, that was right. You can shop uh, shop our site. Um, you can check out through TCG Player. If you just want to do their whole payment process, uh, that's fine. You're welcome to do that. Uh, if you want to select pick up in store, pay later, and then shoot us an email with your uh, shipping information, then we will give you a 7% credit kickback to take off in your next purchase. We call that our, um, uh, not our Ticket to Paradise promotion, that's our Play It Forward Play, promotion. Yeah, that one. Um, which we actually apply on all of our purchases in store. Uh, so if you're ever looking for Warhammer products or board games or dice or s Dragon Shield sleeves, and you're not too far from Bellingham, uh, then come up and shop with us. We give it a 7% rebate. It's actually a 2d6% rebate Indeed. on everything, um, but we're going to make it 7% if you're remote. Um, so now uh, it looks like we're going to probably play you one song of Capacity, maybe two, and then get you back here for round two, part B. Excellent. Well done. See you soon.
you're me. Alrighty, welcome back. We've got a little bit of Jesse versus Steven here in the feature match area. Looks like we've got Mono Green Devotion versus uh, Not Maze's End, which is a fancy name for uh, Bant Field of the Dead deck. So uh, both of these decks trying to ramp. Uh, they're accomplishing their end game slightly differently. Steven, of course, trying to cast large creatures, Ulamog, Nissa to ramp out, Walking Ballista, whereas Jesse's just trying to ramp into potent threats while also making you know tens of zombies in the meantime so we'll see how this matchup tends to play out right, i'm gonna make a bold prediction here yeah well maybe it's not the bold i'm gonna make a prediction here and i don't know these decks well enough to know how bold it is um but i'm going to say that jesse is going to win the game if he casts a wrath that destroys one of steven's lands and he will lose the game if he does not do that all right well i guess we'll see how this goes so We'll see who's on the play here. Didn't get a good look. Temple of Mystery pulled the front of Jesse's hand. Hour of Promise, Growth Spiral, Field of the Dead, other cards. Also, uh, this is exhibition gameplay. Both of these players won their round two very rapidly. Yes. And so sat down to play across from each other. Yep. And so, you know, figured if they're playing some practice games, this was uh, the, the quote-unquote match that we could get on camera. So uh, decided to go ahead and uh, let these two play anyway. Figures uh, it'd be better than uh just leaving you with commercials or as good as the music is you know still probably prefer some gameplay so steven's gonna kick things off with once upon a time looks like he's bringing forest to the front and he will in fact get that play it elvish mystic on turn one over to jesse i expect a nice temple of mystery to kick things off indeed it will let's see what we find looks like scry to the bottom over to steven so steven's deck has had two cards banned from it already in this format? Indeed, and he's still playing it. <laughs> well, I imagine they had to ban cards because the deck was pretty good. Indeed, so yeah. So the things we lost were Leyline of Abundance and Oath Veil of, of Summer. And Oath of Nyssa. Yeah. This deck has had three cards banned from it. Indeed. So, definitely <laughs> looks like Steven kept a nice zero lander with a Once Upon a Time and some <laughs> Elvish Mystics. <laughs> <Ooh>. <laughs> Got Ooh. there, but did not hit on the second time. Looks like Jesse's firing off a nice main phase... Uh, growth Spiral. Growth Spiral. We'd love to see that. So here comes Field of the Dead. There's the second forest for Steven. One land off of playing the Nyssa he has in his hand. Here's Jade Light Ranger. Forest to hand and forest to hand. I'm sure Steven's reasonably happy with that. No, nah, he's flooded now. That sucks. Poor guy. <laughs> He will, of course, see Nyssa, who shakes the world, coming down next turn. Jesse, probably pretty keen to that. We'll see what he wants to do. An attack for one with the Elvish Mystic will set Jesse to 19. And let's see what Jesse's got. Here comes Elvish Rejuvenator. Ah, yes. It's J Light Ranger. It's uh, smaller. It always draws one land, and it puts it on the battlefield. Yeah, pretty much. So here is... Uh, Temple of the White Temple. Plenty. Temple of Plenty. <laughs> I don't, I've uh, not very played very much with Temple of Plenty in recent years, or ever. Temple so. of the White Temple sounds like the name of a Yu-Gi-Oh card. Definitely. <laughs> All right, so here is Forest from Steven. Burning Tree Emissary was the draw, so he'll even get to go ahead and play his Burning Tree Emissary before he casts his Nyssa, but eh, he, he doesn't elect to. No need to. Well, you know that you're going to end up losing this uh, forest to a Supreme Verdict, and you don't want to lose your Burning Tree Emissary to that Makes Supreme sense. Verdict as well. Makes sense. What Steven doesn't know is that he's already locked in to lose all the games that he loses this forest to the Supreme Verdict. <laughs> so Jesse's now 100% to win this game, and let's see how that plays out. <laughs> all right. Well, Steven, uh, of course, set pretty far behind in mana, but after he plays his land for the turn, he's still going to have six mana. So we'll see what he wants to do with all of that. Jesse rapidly approaching that seven different land names mark. And Jesse has two Hour of Promise. Yeah, that's a an, lot of zombies. And an Arboreal Grazer in his yeah, hand. That's a lot of zombies. So next turn, Jesse will certainly be able to start triggering his Field of the Dead. I would uh, be slightly surprised if Jesse had anything less than, well, probably six zombies at the end of his next turn. So we'll see what he wants to do. Steven with a Walking Ballista in hand. Next turn, he'll be able to play that for, you know, five or six or something like that. Uh, Lanor Elves, the other card in his hand. I expect to see that come down. No real reason to, to hold it, I think, with a Walking Ballista as a follow-up. I suppose that's true, but uh, it doesn't 
increase the amount that you can cast your walking ballista with at any point. It's um, true. Because it's the odd number, and I'm assuming that Steven doesn't... Oh, I take that back. Uh, er, Nykthos is the, uh, the, the reason why you would want to play that card. Indeed. So... Here comes Hour of Promise. Jesse also notably drew Hour of Promise first turn, so he now has three of them in his hand. So here comes the first one. He's pretty far from casting two of them in the same turn. Yeah, he's... But two turns from now, he'll get to cast Hour of Promise and three whatever and else he wants. Yeah, three, oh, and four. Three and four, yeah. <laughs> Hour of Promise three and four. Also notably, Steven very close to ultimating his Nyssa, so if Jesse does not find a particular a way to deal with this nissa steven's going to be able to go and get all of the forests in his deck put them into play and if he had you know even with just walking ballista in play he's probably going to be able to run jesse over with that you know walking ballista in play plus all of the forests in your deck should lead to a two-turn kill i would uh, assume so jesse had to go get two lands with different names so that he could trigger his field of the dead and make four zombies Indeed. but next hour of promise gets to find two field of the dead and make eight zombies 16 In, 16 zombies it's a lot of zombies yeah so we'll see uh how steven's going to be able to deal with this i want to know if walking ballista in 20 lands can beat 16 zombies a turn uh it can't Okay. Yeah, yeah, it can't. <laughs> um, it, like, theoretically can if you, like, chump out for a turn, point it all upstairs, and then untap and point it all upstairs again. I think that's going to be the best plan, but uh, we'll, we'll have to see if any of that is going to be good enough. So here is, uh, I believe that's Vivian Arcbow Ranger. That's the... F I, 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 you're, the one you're saying is the three-mana one, and I think that's the four-mana one. Uh, I think it's the four-mana one. No, you're one. right. Okay, I'm, yeah. I'm off it. You, you yeah, got this. all right, all right. <laughs> I actually, though, now that you mention it, cannot remember the name of the three men. It's of the Arkbow. Uh, maybe. <laughs> <laughs> you might be right. <laughs> All right, so I always called it three mana Flash Vivian. Oh, Champion of the Wilds. Vivian Champion of the Wilds. That is definitely correct. All right, so we've got some counters on some dudes from Steven. No attacks. Here's the second hour of promise from Jesse, presumably finding Field of the Dead 3 and 4. And, uh... This is where you see these ramp decks just do absurd things. And I'm kind of a proponent for uh, if you're p playing a ramp deck, you should just put Field of the Dead in it at this point. I, I just, it solves all of ramp's problems just like, you know, fundamentally that ramp has. You know, you end up in a point with ramp decks where you're like, oh, I have all my mana, now I just need a payoff, and then you draw more mana. Or, you know, you often draw payoffs too early, and Field of the Dead being both a land and also being a payoff later in the game it's just so insane even if you draw lands off the top of your deck now from jesse he's like oh darn i drew a land here's eight power go I you go know even deeper i'm putting field of the dead as the win condition in my control decks my like blue yeah, counter spell decks whatever yeah because it, all i want to do is draw cards and counter spells and like yeah i want my opponent to die at some point but i don't want to play an elspeth i don't want to yeah, play an whatever Aetherling. yeah like, brazen borrower is kind of dubious i'll include that card it's fine um but really i just want to play lands for my opponent to die yeah, pretty much. And Field of the Dead, I, I think, is a pretty ludicrous card, <laughs> to be entirely honest. I think it uh, it mayhaps shouldn't exist, <laughs> for what it's worth. But regardless from that point, uh, we're going to see Jesse abusing it pretty hard here for the rest of the game. And if he gets to untap, he's going to get to grab another two lands and make four zombies per land. So another eight zombies here. Uh, when Jesse untaps, plus any other spells and lands he manages to draw. Um, we do have enough zombies that we can take loyalty off of Nyssa. Or just go face. But we're concerned about Nyssa's ultimate? We, we are mildly concerned about Nyssa's ultimate, but by the time we have, you know, 30 zombies or whatever, it's usually pretty hard for our opponent to not die. But I mean, this turn. This, oh, yeah. this, this turn, turn we have 10 zombies. They don't have haste, though. No, we, we have 10 zombies that we untapped with we're gonna make eight more zombies this turn yeah 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 so right right now we're in steven's turn i believe oh okay and steven's My debating mistake. steven's debating what he wants to do facing down jesse's 10 zombies or whatever and his, jesse's hand is hour of promise sphinx's revelation <laughs> <laughs> which is just obviously just absurd um so looks like steven Probably debating if he wants to ultimate his Nyssa. Um, he's got 
Nissa on eight. So if he does ultimate his Nissa, obviously he wouldn't be able to uh, be able to make more three threes, and he'd have to try and draw into a relevant threat. And also he would lose his ability to double his mana currently. So uh, you know, actually ultimating this Nissa puts him up probably six or seven mana, but it's actually not as much as you'd think because he loses the doubling ability. And but he doesn't have another one in hand. Gotta be more than seven mana, right? We've only seen four forest this game. True, true, true. He plays sixteen, something along probably those lines. Probably more like twenty. Uh, yeah, it's probably something along those lines. So you probably, you know, you end up going from the current what eight Six. mana that he has available when you count tapping a land for mana and then plusing sure. the Vivian on it, and you go to you know, roughly twenty or something like that. So it is plus quite a bit. You it's are a, right. It's a little bit of an upgrade. Yeah. All right. So the other thing is, uh, once you take sixteen lands out of your deck, uh, you're much more likely to draw Nissa. True. Very, very true. And obviously, every time you don't draw a land, your your percentage of winning the game goes up when you have all your lands. But uh, it's going to be really hard for Steven to win this game, I think. So uh, I think I think the real play is you minus five this Vivian, and you go get your Maul Fist. Enforcer, <laughs> and you proliferate your Nissa and then ultimate her. Yeah, if only. Maybe, maybe a nice spring spring bloom druid. For Ooh, those evolution you, sage. Yeah, for those of you who've been around for a little or a little less recently. So, uh, we've got uh, Stephen really just debating what he wants to do this turn. He's got, he's just been tanking on this Jade Light Ranger Llanowar Elf in hand. I think he's deciding if he has any good attacks. Like, do we need to get in there with a walking ballista with six counters on it? That's not particularly relevant. I mean, it looks like Steven's going to win this game, if anyway, by just shooting Jesse for uh, tw the 13 points remaining with this walking ballista. At least that's what it looks like to me. So, Steven... Notably, casting Jade Light Ranger tells me that he's probably not going to emblem this Nissa this turn. He's probably going to plus it again, and I don't know. I mean, it's rough. I don't know if that's a good choice. We'll have to see how it plays out from Steven. So here's a land. Here is a Llanowar Elves, and then I expect to see Steven plus his Vivian stick a counter on his Walking Ballista and something else, and then probably just send the turn right on back. You can put both the counters on your walking ballista. Oh, very true, very true. That could be what Steven does. He did that last turn, notably. Looks like he did just put it to seven and put a counter on something else. Uh, maybe he made J Light Ranger a three toughness creature. That would make sense. Uh, that sounds pretty uh, reasonable You also to me. have the option to do that on your burning tramissary, so if you want to do it once, maybe you want to do it twice. Or maybe... Steven has done it exactly the correct number of times. So that he doesn't die. Or so that Nissa can't take damage, or so that it doesn't meet some definition of bad attack. Definitely. All right, looks like Steven did put both of them onto Ballista. So uh, we've got... Uh, I'm not sure what the draw was there for Jesse. He's got a... Uh... For me, it's the curly hair. <laughs> <laughs> good, good, good call, good call. Looks like he's tapping quite a bit of mana. This is oh, to fairy was the draw. So this is Sphinx's revelation for four for just enough that we can't play hour of hour revelation, of hour of promise. Not crazy about this line. I think I would have just preferred a nice hour of promise. I mean, I guess you just play a land and make eight. Make you eight make four. Zombies. No eight. Oh, you, four. You know, yeah, it's really it's, four. It's four, yeah. <laughs> okay. It's eight power. I want it to be eight. <laughs> yeah, if only. So if you make four zombies and then you gain access to your Teferi. What are we doing with Teferi? Teferi bounce a land, I guess. Seems like probably the best choice. I don't know. I'm still reasonably worried about dying. Alright, a Boreal Grazer will allow us to play an extra land, which means Told we will get... Eight. Yeah, we will end up with eight zombies. Although, we might not have two lands in our hand. Uh, in that case, our Boreal Grazer is doing a whole lot of nothing relevant. Now we also can't play our Teferi. Yeah, I'm not crazy about how this turn played out from Jesse. I think we, we took a couple suboptimal lines here, and we're ending up with significantly less Plower 
than we want to on this turn. I think if this is our line, then we're committed to throwing a bunch of zombies at Nyssa, and we know that we're going to lose a bunch of them, and then Steven's going to get an attack back, and he doesn't want that attack to be lethal. I mean, the attack back is going to be lethal most of the time. I mean, we only have four untapped zombies, right? But we have four four zombies and two grazers. Two grazers, yeah. that's six bodies. Steven only has eight bodies. That's true. That's true, but you he know can make we do. A ninth one. We do need to worry about this uh, this walking ballista, obviously. I mean, Stephen has the luxury of just kind of shooting down blockers, and it looks like with all of these three power attackers, that will on average profit him damage. So Jesse, I believe, shockingly close to lethal here, and notably, if Stephen just puts some counters on walking ballista, which it looks like that was happening, so he'll go ahead and put one counter on walking ballista, shoot down a zombie, block a few of them. And then Nissa will die? So we must have not shot down a zombie. Because uh, if, we're, if we're not protecting Nissa, we want the counters on the ballista. Yeah, yeah. So it must have just been up to nine counters on a ballista now. So. Our mana just got cut in half if we're Steven. Yeah. Which I like to imagine myself as. Well, congratulations on becoming Steven. Thank you. A feat uh, most of us strive for. Yeah, it was a lot of work. <laughs> yeah. <but. laughs> um. Four cards in hand for Jesse, once upon a time off the top for Steven. This cannot find us a Nyssa, which is definitely the card I want to draw. Yeah, well, oh, speaking of Nyssa, oh. Castle Garenbrig, the land, Nykthos as well. Nykthos looks pretty good, though. Our devotion is seven? It's actually not not that crazy high. Uh, we have all those three, f- don't have Yeah, animals. three from Vivian, a Llanowar Elf, two from Jade Light Ranger, two from Burning Tree Emissary. Oh, there are two from Jade Light Ranger. Uh, one from Merfolk Branchwalker. Is yeah. there a Branchwalker and a Llanowar Elf? Uh, yes. Oh, there's a Llanowar Elf that just got tapped. I thought yeah. there was a forest. So it's really nine? So one, two, three, uh, six, seven, eight, nine. Yes, I believe in Devotion is currently nine. So uh, nice little plus six mana here from our from our Nykthos. So that uh, unfortunately doesn't really break the threshold here for uh, walking ballista activations, right? Because we, plus six mana will put us able to get two counters on our ballista, but still shy of a third, unfortunately. Oh well. So we were at ten zombies last turn, and then we made two more up to twelve, but then we lost four in combat down to eight? I, yeah, I think we have more than that, because... Oh, Steven is showing that we can minus our Vivian for an Ulamog. So that's cool. Yeah, sick. All right. That's good to know. <laughs> um, but uh, Ulamog doesn't... Oh, and yes, he does. I was going to say Ulamog doesn't win here. Jesse has too many permanents that matter. But Jesse needs his library in order to win this game, and yeah, Ulamog handles that. That that family. would probably deal with that eventually. So it looks like Vivian thinking about down ticking for... Not sure what that Nylea's card is. Disciple? That, That's that not doesn't... what you find out. That yeah, wasn't that Nylea's seem... Disciple. That does not seem very good here. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> not familiar with the art, but I'm familiar with the card. That one seems not excellent. Uh, unless, of course, Steven can find random lethal here. Um, Nykthos getting an Ulamog, exiling two blockers, I don't know, could be lethal. I, if I'm, you know, to be honest, we should probably be sitting here doing the math, but I'm just letting them do it. Yeah. <laughs> right, right, right. Yeah, there's so much going on right now that uh, if the players can manage to find lethal through all of these blockers, millions of tokens and all that, uh, I'm pretty happy to just let them go at it or and whatever. There's always the chance that they'll click through the draw step or the, the block step. <laughs> yeah. Good point. Good point. Um, but I do think if you were on the Ulamog plan, you do hit the Field of the Deads because you just want to not die uh, yeah. in the amount oh, of time sure. it takes Ulamog to exile ex- your sure. opponent's yeah. library, the which only, is two swings. The only amount of time, the only reason you would hit blockers is if you manage to calculate a lethal attack. Um, other than that, Field of the Dead, obviously much better. So I believe Elvish Rejuvenator, the draw there from Jesse. Here we see him entering combat. Looks like a bunch of zombies. Just jamming out at Steven. I, I would I would assume that they are going at Steven at least. It seems unlikely that they are not. Well, you gotta gotta make that one loyalty Vivian. Yeah, zero loyalty get it Vivian. out of there. Yeah, it seems loose to me. So looks like Steven lining up blocks. We have one, two, three, four, five, six zombies. 
Looks like they're going to be hitting the bin. And, of course, a good chunk of Steven's creatures will die. And Steven looks like will spend the time to ping down at least a couple other... At least one other zombie, potentially more. Make sure he doesn't die. Oh, there's a Supreme Verdict in Jesse's hand. That's going to kill more lands. That seems good to me. If we can go Supreme Verdict land, but we can't. Oh, we don't have a land. Supreme Verdict Hour of Promise, though? You know, that seems okay. That that ought to get the trick. So that Supreme Verdict killed three lands. So yeah. We've now killed Steven four has lands two mana. With Supreme Verdicts. Yeah, Steven has two mana and a Vivian. Yeah, that does not seem very good. So here is Elvish Rejuvenator. Assuming this finds a land, Jesse, an untapped land, notably, Jesse will be able to cast Hour of Promise. So here's uh, Elvish Rejuvenator, make four zombies, Hour of Promise, make eight zombies and that will do it jesse will clean up that game pretty nicely and yeah that was, that was pretty sweet i enjoyed that game yeah uh having seen them play against each other and get an idea of what the list is um i can definitely now imagine steven surviving uh losing a land to a supreme verdict because you will still have your nissa and nissa is a big deal um, but I, I do feel like that's the interaction that's going to get the band player ahead more often than not. Tend to agree, tend to agree. And obviously, Jesse managed to find all four of his Field of the Dead there pretty important and, you know, really allowed him to go way over the top of whatever Steven was doing. But with that, we're going to go to a quick break here before our third round gets underway. And with that, I would like to thank our third sponsor for the night, Tabletop. Tabletop is the best board game apparel brand in the business. If you like board games, if you like clothing, Tabletop's the place for you. They have excellent merchandise, all types of board games, Dungeons & Dragons, Tabletop games, that type of thing. So if you like... Uh, all of that type of stuff, and you want to show it off, Tabletop is the place for you. Thank you so much to Tabletop for sponsoring the stream. Without them, we wouldn't be able to be here. And with that, we're going to leave you guys with some cat capacity. We'll be right back for round number three. Make sure not to go anywhere. <laughs> Thank you. 
Alrighty, everybody, welcome back for round number three. Here we have Jesse playing uh, Not Maze Zen versus Nick on a Tarka Red. We've got a nice uh, showdown of two decks we've seen recently. Of course, we watched Nick's round two match, and then we watched Jesse beat up on Steven in a nice in game in the interim. So uh, we'll have to see how this goes. Turn one Arboreal Grazer sounds like exactly where you want to be against Mountain Go. Yeah, <laughs> Nick playing Mountain Pass on the draw. Um, I mentioned earlier that I said, uh, do you play Burning Tramissary? And he said, no, that costs two mana. Um, but we, he's got Abbot of Carol Keep and Dreadhorde Arcanist. Those cost um, two mana. <laughs> but then I asked him what his one drops were, and he said Soulscar Mage and Monastery Swiss Rear. And so when he told me the first time that he didn't want to play Burning Tramissary because it cost too much mana, I was imagining 12 one drops or yeah, 16 right, one drops, right. and he's on eight. Yeah, definitely a, a notable point here. So here comes Temple of Plenty, and, uh, scry onto the top from jesse and i mean looking at how this game's playing out i just can't imagine nick ever really winning <laughs> dread horde arcanist is exactly how we do that definitely um, true yeah if we do monastery swiss spear invigorated rampage flashback invigorated rampage now we're talking um then we're going to be getting in for a, a 12 yeah something uh, like with that. trample and that's gonna set a pace that uh that could surpass what Jesse has going on. Absolutely. That being said, Jesse just played his Elvish Rejuvenator, found a Blast Zone. So the door is kind of quickly closing on these one mana threats that you mentioned. And if, you know, Nick tries to really get too cute with these Invigorated Rampages, even a Tarkus Command to a certain extent, he's going to end up getting, you know, just blown out by this onboard Blast Zone here. That's true, but if you if you had the Swiss Spear and the Dreadhorde Arcanist, yeah. um, just those two cards are enough of a threat that Jesse would have to do something. And Definitely true. Blast Zone's not going to get the two for one. Blast Zone costs a lot of mana to get off the ground. Very true. Um, and it gives Nick another turn, because Jesse's win condition is half a bunch of lands in play. And so every time you sacrifice a land, you have one fewer land in play. Yeah, so speak of the devil, here is... Titan Strength on my Dreadhorde Arcanist from Nick. It's going to go ahead and crash in, recast his Titan Strength. So Jesse's going to be taking, geez, seven. seven. Uh, Nick got to scry one twice. Yep, top, top. Um, And then... Uh, Which is, it, I believe, another Titan Strength on top. Oh, excellent. Ooh. Oh, never mind. I was going to say, hopefully we cast cast that during our upkeeps to fix our draw, but it's not <laughs> in our head yet. That's yeah, not that that's, not gonna, that's not going to happen. So here's an attack for one, which I rejuvenator. believe says supreme verdict is happening. Because otherwise, you want the blocker, even if it's uh, not clear that it's going to block this turn. Yeah, it's it's definitely interesting because you know this deck has a lot of trample in it. Uh, the Satarka Red deck, almost all of the time, uh, Nick's creatures will be getting trample from various pump spells, Titan Strength, the Tarka's, or uh, you know, Teamer Battle Rage. Uh, you know, whatever it is. So perhaps Jesse just deciding that I'm not going to block with my 1-1 because, you know, there's just no point and I'm just going to get in for one. Uh, kind of what it screams to me because notably we did not see that Tamer Battle Rage follow-up. Um, and we didn't shock in a Temple Garden, which means we don't have the ability to instant speed a Supreme Verdict this turn. True. Um, but next turn... We'll get to make a series of blocks, and then if our opponent plays something to give us trample and make that feel bad, uh, we'll be get to respond to it with a supreme verdict. Yeah. So here is an attack four two at fairy, I believe, and then uh, Jesse went ahead and uh, blocked. Uh, Nick went to cast a spell. Jesse reminded him that he could not cast a spell in combat, so that just happened. Post combat, wild slash the to fairy. Uh, and then end step, we'll see Jesse tick his blast zone up and put a counter on it. Which means he'll get to use the blast zone to wipe the board um, Indeed. better than that. Leave him with his grazer and his rejuvenator. Yeah, quite So that good. gives him a round of blocks when, Je when Nick rebuilds, and it lets him preserve the supreme verdict in his hand. Absolutely. So looks like Jesse's just going to go ahead and fire this one off in his main phase, get in an attack for one, and I assume just send it back. Jesse notably missing any copies of Field of the Dead, also missing any type of, you know, big haymaker to start kind of closing out the game. If the game continues at this pace, you know, sure, Jesse's done a good job getting this far, but he does need a way to start getting ahead. And speaking of ahead, I think that's a dig through time at the front of his hand. And I think, although I'm not quite certain on Jesse's list, 
um, that he has seven or perhaps eight five mana spells that will let him search his deck for a land of his choice and put it onto the battlefield. That sounds about right to me. Um, they being our promise and the Golos being the rest of them. Yeah, our promise. Uh, certainly better in this deck. You'd rather just get two fields than have a random 3-5 lying around. Um, and, you know, Hour of Promise was a definite all-star back in its day in Standard, and it's no slouch here, uh, holding up its end for sure in Pioneer as well. Looks like Irrigated Farmland was the draw, if I'm correct. I want to talk about Mana Bases and Pioneer. Yes. Because uh, for the first time in as long as I can remember... We have a format with a bunch of dual lands, and it's not obvious, not immediately obvious, which ones you want to play in your deck. Definitely. Um, sometimes you want your Shockland Checkland mana base. Sometimes you want your Shockland Fastland mana base. Sometimes you want your Painland mana base, especially if you're splashing colorless mana. Um, irrigated Farmland and the whole cycling cycle uh, wasn't even on my radar, but those guys are in this format too, and they're showing up, and they're being played in decks. They're quite good in, you know, these decks that are going bigger, and especially Jesse wants as many lands with different names as he can get, uh, so that he can, you know, more reliably trigger his Field of the Dead, speaking of which, he has managed to find a Field of the Dead, and he played it for turn, uh, making a zombie. So, uh, Irrigated Farmland seems like a pretty pretty easy include here. I'd be surprised if the blue-green one wasn't somewhere in here as well. Uh, there is not a blue-green cycling Or the green-white green one. The green-white one, yes. Indeed. Um, so here is an attack for three. And uh, we saw Nick just untap, draw, play a land, and say go. What do you... Nick's hand must just be a whole lot of spells. Oh, hello, Ugin the Spirit Dragon? Ooh. Oh, my. All right, upstairs, I think, with this one. And I'm, Nick spells aren't even burn spells, they're creature pump spells. Yeah, I think we uh, we might be done for here. So, upstairs with the Ugin, attack 4-3, and then play land, make another zombie, will Jesse, Nick will just untap and draw again. Nothing good, a Tarkus Nick, command off the top. Nick tapped one mana and then thought better of it, and what was going through his mind was, end of turn, I need to tighten strength your guy so I can scry, oh wait, you have a Teferi, I can't. Yeah, so this is main phase... Titan Strength, your Arboreal Grazer. <laughs> I'll just become immense on the bottom uh, of my library yeah. pass. Yeah, I think I think we're we're just dead here. Um, now, notably, uh, Jesse only has eight points of damage currently, so he can't actually kill Nick between his attack and his Ugin activation. So Nick will get one more draw step to try and piece together sixteen damage, <laughs> um, which can absolutely be done. Uh, Jesse still has the supreme verdict, which yeah. I guess el eliminates this possibility. <laughs> yeah, I think I think we're we're pretty solidly done here. And it, you know, even if Nick wasn't dead when Jesse untapped, he'd have a new gun ultimate. Uh, so, <laughs> and uh, in addition to creating probably sixteen zombies, I'm really on that number. Uh, that yeah. would gain him seven life. Indeed, yeah. So, uh, you know, Nick, I think. Uh, Going to have to reconsider his plan here in game number two. Turn one Arboreal Grazer. Really uh, really shining through this game. It's I'm, just such a brick wall. I also really like Jesse's chances against turn one Mountain Pass. Oh yeah, also very true. Especially on the draw. You know, Arboreal Grazer or not. I mean, this is just exactly the type of game that these ramp decks are going to win against these, uh, you know, aggressively slanted decks. Here's Stomping Ground off the top for Nick, and I expect that we'll see these cards get picked up here very shortly. <laughs> this is a Tarkus Command, Titan Strength, yeah, just Become Immense. You can cast or Become Immense without delving, so that's nice. <laughs> Sick! <laughs> yeah, it looks like Nick gives it one more glance over and decides that's all for him. Let's take a look at the sideboards now. Over on Jesse's side, we have two Blessed Alliance, one Tireless Tracker, one Oko, Thief of Crowns, one Lavinia, Azorius Renegade, one Lyra Dawnbringer, one Gideon, Ally of Zendikar, two Negate, two Mystical Dispute, one Spell Pierce, one World Breaker, one Corsair of Crew Fix, and a Dig Through Time. Whew! That's a lot of one ofs. That sounds good. Well, we're definitely on Blessed Alliance. Absolutely. Um, probably on Lyra. Um, yes. I do like bringing in Spell Pierce in this matchup. I agree. Um, it almost always nips something. Um, the card that I'm curious about is Lavinia Azorius Renegade. It's often true that in these matchups, especially when you're in colors that don't have good removal, that a 2-mana two 2-2 two -two looks an awful lot like a removal spell. Um, the other thing is that Lavinia is going to prevent Nick from uh, playing Become Immense. 
Dreadhorde um, Arcanist also gets shut off pretty well. Oh, interesting. Yeah. Um, so I think this card's here, and it, I think it's coming in, and I think its uh, real job is to block and die. Um, but it's going to give you some additional value has, along the way. has some other modes if it um, doesn't need to block and die. And I had the same problem uh, when I was just building a Soul Tide deck and I had Oko in it that I'm looking at my sideboard and I'm like, what playable card is there in Soul Tide that gains me life as I'm sleeving up my three Okos? Um, yeah. So yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah uh, Oko probably needs to come in here too. Yeah. I'm not sure what you take out. You take out your Goloses? So you maybe you have some mainboard counter magic that you remove? So oftentimes in these, you know, very heavy land decks, you can afford to trim a couple lands um, in a post-board game, make room for some extra action, make sure you're not getting run over. I ex expect Jesse's deck has somewhere in the vicinity of like 28 lands in it, and that's definitely enough that you can afford to go down to like 26 pretty comfortably or whatever. So that's often a couple quick cuts. Other than that, um, when you're on the draw, you can look to shave some of your top end Ugin doesn't look great. Oh, I'm pretty happy to get Ugin, Ugin out of my look deck. Real bad, that's true. Yeah, I'm pretty happy to get that out of my deck. I definitely don't want multiple copies of Sphinx's Revelation. One is probably fine. I'm I'm more looking to get my life gain from early cards that have a proactive plan that allow me to deal with Nick's threats rather than try and just ramp, ramp, ramp. Okay, Sphinx is Rev for six, and then un have Nick untap and kill me, which often is the case with cards like Sphinx's Rev. Anyways, let's take a look at Nick's sideboard really quick. Ah, we didn't get a chance. It was a couple Tormod's Crypt, a few Tormod's Crypt, some Abrades, Rending Volley, and a Resolute Rider. What sounds good to you there? So this is Nick's first sanctioned Magic the Gathering event. Um, he came in and said, I want to play. We said, what's your DCI number? He said, uh, what? So we brought him to DCI.Wizards.com yep. and had him make a DCI number. Um, he's currently 2-0 in this Pioneer event. He's crushing it. Um, with an 8-card sideboard with a Resolute Rider in it. So I think he's not bringing any of these cards in. In fact, I'm confident he's not bringing any of these cards Tend in. I do agree. Um, and I just love that he's 2-0 and and beating down in that yeah, situation. Yeah, he's smashing people. All right, so let's take a look at the opening hands here. Nick's hand looks a little land light. Um, I see... Well, it looks like he has two, actually, so that looks fine. Monastery, Swift Spear, Dreadhorde Arcanist. Hand looks great from Nick. So probably just waiting on Jesse. I assume that's a snap keep on Nick's side. So here is Stomping Ground Untapped Attack 4-1 from Nick, 19 to 18. Here is Temple of Plenty. Oh, no, that's that like is the Tranquil. tranquil no, Fugit. no, Tranquil. That? Blossoming Sands? Blossoming Sands? Blossoming Sands. It is Blossoming Sands, yes. Uh, that is the green-white enters the battlefield tapped. When it does, you gain one life land, for those of you at home. Uh, I only know that because I recently registered it in uh, Decklister 2, back when Golos was legal and standard. Um, or back when Field of the Dead was legal and standard, rather. You are still allowed to play Golos, as though I do not recommend it. <laughs> uh, so here is Island and Pass from Jesse, potentially holding up Spell Pierce, Disdainful Stroke, that type of thing. Negate. Or not Disdainful Stroke, Negate. Yeah, obviously disdainful not Disdainful Stroke. stroke. Would be real poor here. Yeah, I, I don't think know why Disdainful Stroke. we're going to see stroke. a Titan Strength on the Dreadhorde Arcanist into... Ooh, that oh, that seems real good. No, I think we're going to see a Arcanist Arcus Command. Command. I actually oh, like less. Yeah. Yeah, so it gets spell pierced either way. But now you can't cast it a second time. Yep. Where if you played your Titan Strength and it got spell pierced, you'd, you'd still get be able to cast to. it on the backside. You'd get to scry. You'd get to find more action. Definitely. So uh, he could have also deployed a uh, Soul Scar Mage if he had done it in that order. But uh, regardless, we saw this line. Nick left with Collision Colossus, Titan Strength, Soul Scar Mage, and others in hand. So. We'll see what he wants to do. Next turn could be very painful for Jesse if he doesn't find a way to deal with this Dreadhorde Arcanist or have a plan to uh, prevent Nick from just going off. I would like to see an upkeep Titan Strength from Nick uh, because you were so rewarded if you hit a land. I agree, yeah. So we'll see what Jesse wants to do. I think he's got... Looks like Hour of Promise in hand, but we're a little ways off that, of course. Here's Temple of Plenty. It'll allow him to scry one. Looks like that card's going to stay where it is. And uh, back to Nick. So, unless... Oh, Jesse still has that Ugin in his deck. I don't love that. So, we didn't get the upkeep Titan Strength, but... We did uh, spike the land anyway, yeah, so yeah, whatever. Yeah. yeah, like a champion, actually. <laughs> Nick didn't come here to not... Yeah, 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 I respect that. He, he's having a little bit of what I'm having here. <laughs> you just, just always have it. You don't need to worry about scrying to, to get to it when you just always get it. <sighs> Must so. be nice. It is. It's quite I nice. I will never uh, register Tron 
in a competitive REL tournament again because I have done it twice and have never had Tron. Yeah, that uh, that happens sometimes. I I do I have registered Tron, um, not frequently, but in a couple events. And I will say, uh, I oftentimes mulliganed to three or four, and uh, I uh, have yet to lose a game on a mulligan to three or four. <laughs> so. <laughs> It feels, you usually only lose when you keep your, like, greedy six-card hands. It feels like if you just go to three, you just you just win. So we have a pre-combat Titan Strength here into an Atarka's Command. Yeah, that sounds right to and me. And then we have the Collision Colossus in hand. So yeah. going to 13, and then we've got four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. That's four damage. So a Collision Colossus is lethal here. Holy crap. That's a lot of damage. <laughs> so, yeah, we've got... Um, looks like... Uh, Jesse has just a bunch of deserts in his hand. Yeah, Jesse... I, looks I think like Nick he's, is Jesse's showing his opponent nothing. too much respect. Yeah, he's just going to go for it here. Oh, no, here it is. Okay. Yeah, I think we're just still in the combat step. Here's an extra five damage from the Collision Colossus. And assuming your math is correct, that's lethal, but I haven't done it yet so let's see we've got two power three prowess triggers that's five plus two titan strengths that's an extra six There's up only to one 11 titan strength this round it's titan strength oh. Atarka's command. Yeah, yeah, yeah you're right so plus titan strengths up and plus a tarkus command so six the Atarka's command is two extra so seven eight plus the collision colossus is uh 13 17 by my math so that sounds like lethal to me Assuming that we're remembering all of our triggers and everything. Right, and you didn't count the Atargus Command 3 damage, you counted the its impact oh. on power and toughness. Because uh, that's how we got him from 16 to 13. Yeah, if that's true, then yeah, <laughs> we're, we're really, really dead. Yeah, I think this is a 20 damage turn. That can't I, be right. It I, be. I think it's 17, but it's it's lethal, I'm pretty sure. Yeah, looks like our players agree, they did, they did the math. Wow. Yeah, all right. That's so, pretty ridiculous, honestly. So Nick will have to learn, and if he keeps playing here, we'll teach him that Jesse also never has it, so just always jam it against <laughs> it's Jesse. It's true, Jesse does not ever have it. Yeah, <laughs> very, very true. <laughs> you know, we when you sign up to play Magic the Gathering, and, you know, we really should have talked to Nick about this before he made his DCI number, you have to decide if you're going to be one of the players that always has it or one of the players that never has it. And, you know, there's strong learning decisions to be made on either side, and you have to spend a long time figuring out which one of those players you are. But uh, coming from the side where you always have it, uh, I strongly recommend my side. It's definitely a better place to be. Jesse chose incorrectly when he signed up for the Wizards of the Coast Magic the Gathering game. Um, looks like Nick is uh, starting off right. Always yeah, having it. Yeah, he's doing all right. Yeah, he, he definitely chose correctly. He clicked the little I would like to always have it box when he registered his DCI number today. Um, and so he's, he's immediately getting rewarded here. And Jesse, I think, just kind of scrolled through the user agreement or something and missed out. And, you know, I think this is actually the, uh, the trick. And uh, I'll launch an investigation into this further. But uh, I think if your DCI number is a prime number, you're whitelisted. <laughs> maybe, maybe, maybe. I'll, I'll start the investigation. Yeah. <laughs> gonna have to. It's gonna be like mining Bitcoin. <laughs> <laughs> look up, uh, look up all the pros, and that's why there's so many more pros um, that have been playing the game forever than there yeah, are. Yeah, I'm pretty sure LS, LSV's DCI number is one. So yeah, that tracks out. <laughs> one, uh, not a prime. <laughs> three, that, three. A, you got no, me. Three, all right, three I think. Um, Jesse's probably trying to figure out, uh, if he makes any changes going into the next one. Yeah, I saw that Ugin, and I do not, I do not want that Ugin in my deck, let and me tell you. Even when I went through all the cards I wanted to bring in, and there were already more than I thought we would find room for, yeah. I didn't include Corsair of Crufix. Uh, I'm not certain that Corsair of Crufix, oh, there is one in the sideboard. I thought we were talking about main deck Corsair of Crufix. Yeah, that, that's obviously gotta come in. Yeah. yeah. Not that, uh, I mean, it's got a big butt. It gains your life and it draws cards. Yeah, I mean, you're going to have to block with it every time, and, you know, it's going to probably die to a pump spell or whatever. But if that happened, it probably gained you one life, blocked, gained you, you know, probably five life in that block or whatever, and forced a card out of Nick's hand and, while doing it. That seems pretty, pretty excellent to me. And if it doesn't die, you know, if you just get to make the decision that you want to take the five and untap with it and then, you know, cast an Hour of Promise or whatever, Land it gains or board, life. Or yeah, 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 exactly. You know, then you have that choices to be made as well, but 
Looks like we're going to game number three here. Jesse will keep his opening hand. Nick sending it back. So, looks like we're going to see uh, potentially a much less explosive hand here in game number two. Nick, of course, on the draw, on a mulligan. Expect much less power out of this hand than the last one. Uh, last hand had a lot of toughness. <laughs> True, but also roughly 17 power. Oh, I suppose. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so we've got, looks like Titan Strength, some lands, double Abbot, looks like four lands. So we're going to put a land away. And then yeah. I, we're, he's already on the mulligan, right? Yeah, this is already a six-card hand, so, so I think we're going to have to keep, keep it. it. But it's like a slow Ooh, card. Oh, we sent it. Oh, yeah, we're going to think about this one. We get to send a land back. Yeah, it looks like Nick says it's not good enough. That is roughly the hand that he got trounced with in game number one. Yeah, so, and that's exactly the kind of hand that Jesse is ready to feast Yeah, on. exactly. And, and Nick's on the draw again. Feels like a, a very disciplined mulligan. And this is one of those mulligans that I can't tell you if I think this mulligan is right or not. I haven't played the matchup enough. Um, these are the types of mulligans that you look at and you initially go, six, you probably have to keep it. But if the matchup is to the point where, like, you know, if you let them live and you let them, you know, go to their turn four or whatever and you haven't started attacking, you're just dead in the water, then this will turn out to have been a very good and disciplined mulligan from Nick. Of course, looks like he's not been particularly rewarded. I disagree. He's got two lands, Dreadhorde Arcanist, and two pump spells. And that's, that's how you do 20 damage on turn four. That's, that's true. That's true. That is a very explosive plan. Looks like he's going to be setting land and a pump spell to the bottom here. Um, he's only going to play one threat in the period of the game that matters. And if Jesse answers it, Nick's mm. going to lose. But Indeed. you're on the mulligan to five on the draw. You you got to you gotta do what you got to do. Yeah. And Jesse never has it. True. True, true, true. Jesse definitely never has it. So there's a land off the top from Nick. Not quite what he wants to see. The third land, definitely something he'll want to find eventually this game, but I think he'd prefer to start things off with spells. We do want to play Titan Strength and Invigorated Rampage in the same turn. Definitely. Although I believe uh, Nick put Invigorated Rampage on the bottom of his deck. I believe he has Collision Colossus Titan Strength instead. In this situation, those are the same card. They are. Yeah. yeah. They're, oh, they're no. Jesse has card. it. Yikes. Well, th this doesn't quite count as it. You know, it buys him a turn, but it's definitely not doing the most relevant things immediately. Now, notably, we are going to need to just wild slash this Teferi because Teferi does shut off all of the things we want to do with our Dreadhorde Arcanist because we cannot cast the spells from our graveyard at instant speed. Now, what I'm worried about is that we play our Dreadhorde Arcanist and then pass, planning on wild slashing the Teferi at end of turn, and then get politely reminded that we're not allowed to do that. Uh, yeah, hopefully... I've been that guy. Yeah, we've all done that. But it looks like Nick not going to make that mistake. So, good on Nick. Go ahead and wild slash that to Fairy. Take it out. And uh, here's the draw. Settle the wreckage in hand for Jesse. That one's pretty spooky. Here's Elvish Rejuvenator. I think he, Jesse might be missing on lands currently. Um, we'll see if he ends up playing another land from hand or if this is just going to be his only land for the turn. If that's the case... Nick's going to be feeling pretty good. He can attack with this Dreadhorde Arcanist and just go ahead and Wild Slash down an Elvish Rejuvenator to guarantee get in for the amount of damage he wants to. Um, do we not have Trample? Does Dreadhorde Arcanist... Dreadhorde Arcanist tramples. Uh, yeah, Dreadhorde Arcanist does trample. You're right. So that that seems probably unnecessary. All right. So Abbot of Carol Keep off the top. So Nick's now got the green light. Jesse has a single Blast Zone. It's his only land. And... Let's see what Nick decides to do with this turn. Here comes Collision Colossus, a five power Dreadhorde Arcanist now. So we're going to combo off here and do 12. Looks like here's Titan Strength. So he'll get to scry one. So currently we have a eight power, uh, an eight power Dreadhorde Arcanist. We get to scry. It looks like, did we miss our Dreadhorde Arcanist trigger? No, I think we also didn't. We also scry didn't scry with the with Titan, the Titan Strength. Strength. Oh, it looks like Nick must have announced it verbally, but did not uh, take the motion. Oh, here's the scry. Just a slight out of order here, but nothing to worry about. So, Jesse, all the way down to seven. So, I thought that was going to be 12, right? That's one plus eight plus eight plus three. It's one or plus one four plus four plus four, four plus, plus three. three. That was so my math should be math 12. Well. So, that should put him to nine, not to seven, unless we missed, like, yeah, a shock I, or something. I agree. I agree. Um, so... Um, looks like they're they're doing the math now. Um, 
unless no, no, I think I think we're right. I think they're they're correcting them the math. I saw Jesse make a mark on his notepad there, so should be going up to a nine here. And Nick has a if he has another spell in his hand here, he could have lethal. So there's a Tarkus command off the top. It feels like uh I've said there's a Tarkus command off the top a lot of times while watching Nick. <laughs> it feels like every 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 time he untaps he just draws a Tarkus command. It's pretty ridiculous. So uh, we'll have to make sure he uh, doesn't have a prime number uh, Janimer. Yeah, yeah, I'm yeah, gonna yeah. have to send an angry email asking him to change mine. <laughs> All right, here's a Tarkus command: three to Jesse and plus power to Dreadhorde Arcanist. It will attack, so uh, Nick will get to flashback a Tarkus command despite Jesse casting Settle the Wreckage. So Jesse's gonna go down to three here. Uh, this format is woefully low on three damage burn spells. Wild yeah. Slash isn't going to get there. Notably... And we haven't seen a Lightning Strike or a Skull Crack or anything like that. Indeed. I don't believe he's playing them. So here is going to be a main phase to Abbot of Carol Keep. He's not going to be able to cast the spell, unfortunately. That that white, shiny... It, it <laughs> was a Soul it Scar Mage. Oh, alright. Whatever it is, we're not yeah, casting it. Yeah, it was it, a so Soul Scar Mage. Far be it for us. Yeah. Um, An Hour of Promise can gain us two life here. Definitely. Pretty relevant, also. Or it can get us one life and make yeah. a zombie. That seems pretty good. Oh, we already have we have a, a field, field of the, of the dead, dead, so so we need to get two different names. No, we already yeah. have six different names, so we can get a field of the dead and a life gain spell and a life gain land and go up to four. Um, seems then we let our opponent untap with a threat. Uh, yeah, but we have blockers, so he doesn't have any cards in hand. Uh, we're gonna make two block or what four blockers, four zombies. I mean, if we just stack all four zombies in front of an 16? abbot, we're not we're not gonna die. Yeah, sixteen, sixteen. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I'm committed. <laughs> Every time Jesse plays a land, it makes 16 zombies. <laughs> yeah, that thing looks good. Yeah. Notably, if you play uh, Field of the Data against Brad, your deck gets way better. <laughs> <laughs> Every time it's late, 16, and Brad will just nod. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Man, that card's really absurd. I see why it got banned. <laughs> Corset 2020 has three cards from it that, that card, are banned in standard. That, that set's not reasonable. No, it's, no, it's that, really not that reasonable. That set's not even good. Yeah, it's that set is completely on. <laughs> and I have gripes with many of the other cards. Like, what is Legion Zen doing? Why is that card allowed? It's so unreasonable. Why, for two mana, do you just kill all of my early game plays, rip my hand of them, and not to mention it kills all of my payoffs too? It kills Hydroid Crisis. It kills Voracious Hydra. It kills all of the things I want to do early. It kills all of the things I do late. It and it thought seizes. And it thought seizes them from my hand too. It's completely unreasonable. I played a game where I played Nissa, plus on a forest, and then he Legion Zen'd my forest and stripped three forests from my hand, and then I got mana screwed. It was completely. It's stupid. <laughs> it's stupid. I hate that card. <laughs> it's just like, kill, Legion's at your forest, kill your Nissa, go. I just had like two lands in play. I was bummed. All right. Anyway, I digress. So, looks like Nick untapped a Drew card. He's going to send it back to Jesse. Jesse went up to four, like we mentioned, got some zombies in play. So, now Jesse's looking to turn the corner and looks to have stabilized here. Elvish Rejuvenator is going to find us a land and make uh, two more zombies. Indeed. Three if it's a Field of the Dead. And then, um, if it was Nick, this Growth Spiral would make more zombies, but for Jesse, it's not. <laughs> Alright. Here's Irrigated Farmland. Appears to be the land of choice. Two zombies on the way, and I'd be surprised if we didn't see uh, Jesse start getting in here. Um, you are on a clock. You do need to win the game. So... Uh, you know, you've got some blockers left behind. We've got, you know, four zombies in play. That's eight power. I think it's time to start crunching in. We can pretty easily um, establish a lethal attack next turn by taking our blast zone up to two and, you know, casting a growth spiral, spiral or something like that. So uh, hopefully we'll see Jesse do just that. Here's the growth spiral. Draws a card. Puts, ooh, fabled passage. That's a good one. Ooh. Told you it wouldn't make two zombies. Yeah, mountain means four hand. zombies. For Jesse, or for Nick, unfortunately. That is uh, not it, unfortunately. <laughs> Bad news. All he's right. counting his deck, but I want to know what he's looking for. I don't know that there's anything. Resolute uh, Stomping Ground, definitely not it. So I think that that means we're going to see Jesse make some more zombies, take his Blast Zone up, and then go ahead and make a lethal attack on the next turn. And Nick left with not but lands, can't do anything about it. 
there's the face up lands and uh i believe that is the match going towards jesse so despite never having it uh we've seen jesse come out victorious here um that was a pretty good match just gotta redefine what it is yeah you can't draw it and draw something else <laughs> definitely definitely so uh with that, I'd like to take a moment to thank our third sponsor for the night, Die Hard Dice. Die Hard Dice is the best in the business when it comes to making metal dice. Uh, everybody who plays Dungeons & Dragons, other role-playing games, uh, tabletop variety mostly, uh, knows that it's it's awesome to have the best swag. You know, these tabletop games they're usually pretty minimalistic you don't have too much going on so having the coolest dice definitely an awesome way to you know kind of show off what's going on how much you're into the game your character that type of thing it's about um, status it's about dedication you definitely. know um we work so hard we buy these collector's packs we buy these uh masterpiece you know, foils, to like basically. show people like i'm committed to this look how much i care about yeah, this sweet thing definitely and this is a way to bring that to your DD character it's a way to bring it to your planeswalkers absolutely um the caltrops the d4s are masterwork they do 1d4 plus one damage if you step on them i swear be very careful about that <laughs> that makes sense and and in case you haven't already been sold i have it on a uh, good notice from a friend that they do roll a 20 more often than one in 20 times so you better get on that i would check that source uh, uh i don't think that's a desirable I, thing i'm pretty sure they're they're very they're very true <laughs> um so anyway i highly recommend you check out die hard dice we have some in store so if you're looking to pick some up and you're in the bellingham area you can always come into paradise games grab yourself a set of die hard dice and make sure you get that play it forward discount when you do so and once again thank you to die hard dice for supporting the stream with that uh let's play some hot damn scandal and we'll see if we can get you a match for the remainder of this round but we will definitely be back soon for round number four at the very least so make sure you don't go anywhere cool
The bottom fell out of the clouds today And the rain came down like a mirror One big sheet and it shattered on the ground Now it's seven years of bad luck all over this town mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It's collection time on all of your debts and Alrighty, we're back. Got some more exhibition gameplay here between Jesse and Steven. We got a little bit of blue-white control versus uh, the same old Bant field deck that Jesse's been slamming people with all night. On uh, Jesse's 3-0, uh, Steven is, I believe, 2-1, but there was some weirdness with Steven's first match. Um, he showed up late with someone else, so they got paired against each other. Uh, he did just get slammed oh. <laughs> in that match, yeah, so he, uh, he did uh, cleanly lose in two games, although the end of that second game was uh, in turns, but he did just lose the match two games to zero, so... Um, and is this blue white deck what he's playing in the tournament tonight? It's not. He's playing mono green devotion in the tournament. Oh right. Wait, I didn't know that. I saw him play exhibition games last round. All right. Yeah, well, thanks mono for your green information. Devotion. Indeed. <laughs> I'm just confused. Um, but he is playing mono green devotion in the tournament. So here we see a little bit of a, uh, a different take. Here we got to see mono green versus this uh, fancy field of the dead deck uh, last time. Now we see blue white control. Um, I don't think blue white control has a particularly good plan to beat field of the dead. They have some copies of Field of Ruin, but, like, that's kind of it. I have to imagine that your plan to beat Field of the Dead is Elspeth. Yeah, that doesn't seem like that's really going to work. I don't know. I mean, I have played a little bit of this Blue Eye deck, um, and it feels like it's pretty good against a lot of the things. It has a lot of answers to things people are doing and all that, but it just doesn't... You just don't feel like you're really going to beat a plan like Field of the Dead. Uh, like, you have some Field of the Ruins, but they're much better at putting Field of the Dead into play than you are at putting Field of Ruin into play. And um, if they just draw Field of the Dead, you don't really have a way to stop that. And, you know, obviously we're going to see, you know, some counter spells being fired off here at, you know, Jesse's various threats as he plays them. And, you know, Steven basically doing his best to uh, prevent... Uh, these field of that's from entering the battlefield, and uh, yeah, you can go ahead and talk about this one. Oh, that was an excited chest pound. Oh man, I don't want to tap out for Elspeth. That's not how I plan on winning the game. This blue eye control deck just played its field of the dead, and that's exactly what I want to do. Is I just want to counter your uh, promise of our, our promise, promise and your Teferi so that my counter spells don't go offline, and then I want to play lands and I want you to die for some reason. Yeah, sick. Um, notably. Steven's sitting on a bunch of same land names, so we're still quite a ways off these field of that activating. I think we have, what, two Hallowed Fountains, Plains Island, Glacial Fortress, Castle Field of, of the Dead, Dead, Castle of Interest. So I guess we have five. And that's a big downside on the two color decks. Is like Definitely. The, the upside is your mana works, um, but like there's this thing about Field of Ruin where like your mana's not supposed to work. Like We saw Jesse st struggle in game two last round um, when he played... Blossoming Sands and uh, Temple of the Green White Temple. Temple and, of Plenty, indeed. Right. Uh, and that's the penalty, but the upside is you you get all these blockers, you overrun your opponent. Yeah. So here we see uh, Irrigated Farmland. That is land name number seven for Steven, and he gets a uh, zombie token. Uh, I must... I've, I've credited Steven for his excellent choice of tokens on stream before, but I'd like to once again mention, uh, for zombie tokens, he uses Golettes, uh, the Pokemon, and that was uh, much funnier back when uh, it was Golos and the Golettes, um, <laughs> when he made zombies, so uh, I thoroughly enjoyed that one, but I, I credit Steven for sticking it out with the Golettes, uh, I think they're quite good, and now we see uh, Bob Marr versus the Golettes, and uh, in the, the token battle, what, what side do you land on? Um, well... In this case, I'm aware that the two creatures traded, um, but I did just see Mar turn sideways and the Golet step in the way, and Mar is still there. True. So if we want to know which one's the great one, Bob Mar. Bob Mar is probably better at magic than a Golet. I, uh, I, I mean, I, I don't consume a whole lot of Pokemon lore, but like enough of these things like create and destroy universes at a whim that I bet they could play magic pretty effectively. That's fair. I don't know if Golet is one of them. But it's a psychic Pokemon. Like, oh, if it doesn't seems, know what to do, it's just going to use Jesse, right? So it's only, okay, okay. at worst, it's as good as its opponent. Yeah, okay. I buy that. That seems that seems good to me. 
All right, so probably Golette favored in the uh, in the Magic the Gathering off, but uh, Bob Marr superior in physical prowess. Uh, <laughs> so sounds like the start of a good anime. And, and uh, Bob Marr is just uh, there's more of him. He's just strength in numbers. <laughs> it's a lot, whole lot of Bob Marr. Yeah, <laughs> there's at least a couple. It appears. All right, so here's Jay's Supreme Verdict, Jace Architect of Thought. Let's Revealing see. Revealing Narset, Seal Away, Teferi. Oh, I thought that the Seal Away was an Elspeth, and I was about to go off about minus my Flame Walker, <laughs> three, three Flame Walkers. Walkers. Which two only two. It was only two. It was only two. So he kept, he did decide to keep Narset and Seal Away instead of the big Teferi. Speaking of Teferi, here's a little small Teferi. Uh, for Jesse, and that of course will shut off Steven's counter spells for the rest of however long that's in play. So that's your colonnade is not going to threaten that thing. This blue white control deck must have Mutavolt in it, right? I'm not certain. I mean, depends how many field that adds you're playing. You can't get away with too many colorless lands. You know, you are trying to play like Azorius Charm and um, Supreme Verdict and all that, and those are pretty color color heavy. So, but you do want more card names. You do, definitely true. So we'll see. Uh, you know, which of those lands Steven actually decided to put in his deck. It's actually a pretty interesting puzzle in a two-color deck. You know, which lands you can get away with. You know, Castle Vantress, Castle Ardenvale, those seems like kind of free rolls. You'd usually put those in your blue-white control deck anyway, but after that, you get Glacial Fortress, Hallowed Fountain, Basics. Eh, you, now you're kind of struggling. It looks like Irrigated Farmland was one of the choices for Steven. Well, again, the interaction I had in the Soltai deck is, uh, like, obviously you want to play your Castle Vantress, um, but when your mana base is uh, three Breeding Pool, three Watery Grave, two Hinterland Harbor, two Drowned yeah. Catacomb, one Temple of Mystery, one Lumbering Falls, yeah. one Hissing Quagmire, those castles stop looking free real fast. Definitely true. And especially when you're trying to build a Field of the Dead mana base, you can't put that many cards that are islands in your deck. We don't have that access. To, we don't have access to that many of them. I right? have uh, Nissa Who Shakes the World and uh, Seven Forests. <laughs> three overgrown tomb, three breeding pool, one basic. One basic, yeah. Yeah, you gotta do what you gotta do. And you know, I, it appears that Steven likely also has Fabled Passage in his deck if he's playing uh, Field of the Dead, I would expect, because I do often see these blue-white decks just elect to not have the Fabled Passage in your deck, and if you really don't need it, for the, for the fixing, so it's not worth having a tap land before turn four. And, you know, a lot of people say, well, you're a control deck, you, do, you you can play tap lands, it's whatever. But the turns that you actually really need your untapped mana are, like, turn two, three, where you want to be playing an interactive spell, a syncopate, and absorb, or whatever, on curve, so that you don't fall too far behind. So, uh, definitely going to have to sacrifice some consistency with his mana in order to support this field of the dead. And, well, admittedly, in this game, it, uh... It looks like it did not do quite enough to be able to uh, sweep up the victory, but I believe that players likely are going ahead and just scooping up the cards due to the next round starting, I would have to assume, because it didn't quite look like that match was anywhere particularly close to over. Except Jesse had creatures, and Steven didn't. That's true. Perhaps he was just dead. Maybe I think his Jesse planeswalkers were going of, to fall off the battlefield, and he of. felt like he had lost control of this game. That seems likely. Um, I do want to talk a little bit about Fabled Passage in the blue-white control decks with Field of the Dead, because you have another tension here in that you're playing Field of Ruin, you're playing Fabled Passage, and you don't want to play 12 basics because you don't want hands with a bunch of islands and a bunch of planes. So if you're going to run six or eight ways to search out basics, how many basics are you playing? Definitely true as well. And this is where these like mana-based puzzles really come in. And, you know, we haven't had Frank Karsten to tell us, you know, exactly what mana we should be playing in this format for too long. So you're going to see people register decks with suboptimal mana bases a lot early on in this format. And in fact, if you don't spend a good hour, hour and a half or whatever, really thinking about your mana base, you're probably going to struggle to submit a correct mana base yourself. And I love it. I totally slept on the Shadows of Ernest and Handland Shadow over Innistrad Handlands. Yep. Like those were so unplayable town. when they were in standard that yep. we didn't even have to give them a real name. It's true. <laughs> um, but they look a whole lot better when you've got uh the Shocklands, the Tangos, Tangos yeah, Tango lands the aren't the bad. cycle lands have the yep. basic land type. 
The um, castles are surprisingly good. We've also got the uh, Amon Cat of Devastation yeah. Deserts that are pretty Which good. Which enter untapped. Yeah, oh, Ramanap nice. Ruins is really good. And we can see even cards like Sunscorch Desert have been making impacts in them, like Mono Red decks as well. You know, back to those like old school decks. If you uh, remember the good old, you know, Earthshaker Kenra Hazaret days. Speaking of which, we've seen a lot of variation in Mono Red too in these formats. I mean, every Mono Red deck has like. 20 different cards. It's ridiculous. <laughs> yeah, I feel like we could build six mono red decks. Yeah, definitely. In this room, there's four. Um, we have So Gavin is here tonight. He built mono red burn and mono red goblins. Yeah, very um, different decks. He has two 60s and one 15. <laughs> <laughs> That's excellent. Yeah. All right. Well, anyways, we're going to cut to a very short break here we're gonna leave you with some hot damn scandal we'll be back with our fourth and final round of the night make sure you do not go anywhere and uh yeah our fourth round should be starting in just a couple minutes so we'll see you soon of the barrel I like to sleep in hidey holes and barroom stalls I like to hear the piano playing in the bloody little dawn I like to wake up with the devil and drink him till he's gone the queen is drunk and someone armed the poor I've never thought to own There is no clear left So we filter it through cigarettes For the gambler's mercy Keeps us blind and free Thank you. 
lying on my bruises Defined my edges against skies of gray But now my worries are all far away The sky is clear And I begin to fade Once I believed in paradise A place where I would never Feel no pain A state of mind I never have to change But now it all looks alright And I begin to fade Trouble to fade. Alrighty, welcome back for the fourth and final round of the night. We've got Noble playing uh, Route Tribal, otherwise known as Blue White Control, and James on Mono Black. Uh, so, uh, what are your initial thoughts for this matchup? Um, so, this Mono Black deck is really Mono Black humans. Um, you do have like Scrap Heap Scrounger and maybe something else, um, but you have a lot of cards in your deck that are trying to draw cards and generate advantage. Um, it really was hoping to be more aggressive than this dart shows. Um, yeah, Swamp Swamp is not where you want to be on the draw against Blue White Control, I don't think. Um, but it stands a chance. You've got Dresses, you've got Kite Sail Freebooters, you have Glint Sleeve Siphoners, you've got, um, uh, Grim... Initiate? Grim... No. It's a 3-mana three 3-2 three from Cons of Tarkir. Grim That's Horror a Specs? Yeah, you have Grim Horror Specs. Um, so you do have a lot of ways to not fall behind when your opponent Supreme Verdicts. Um, which is what we're here for. Ooh, morph. So this is a morph. So this is 100% a Grim Horror Specs. Yeah, let's see if Noble knows. Um, well, he does now. You do have to reveal yeah, that. Yeah, you do. So oh. I would like to say there's almost no reason to play this card face down. Um, it's three mana on the front side. It's three mana to play face down. It's a three, two on the front side. It has an ability on the front side. Yeah, I mean, the only real reason is you try and, you know, get your opponent who isn't isn't going to be familiar with the potential morphs in the deck. Oh, but. there is another morph in the deck. There's the two-mana Megamorph 2-1 two that uh, kills a small thing, like Solungar Assassin, I think is his yeah, name. Yeah, that sounds right to me. There's I a, vaguely the, remember playing playing some of that in Limited. Yeah, there's yeah. a cycle of <laughs> yeah, Stratus yeah, Dancer yeah, cards. Yeah, I remember that one. There's some, of Redis, some are better than others. Only one of them got downgraded to uncommon in a Master Set. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, here it is, Sylvgar's Assassin. So, yeah, sure enough. Creatures with power greater than Sylvgar's Assassin cannot block it. It's got that good old Den Protector text. Megamorph, when it's flipped face up, destroy a creature with power three or less. And uh, James flipped the swamps that he tapped to pay for that face down. <laughs> that's, definitely, <laughs> that's definitely a choice. Is that, is that how he taps his mana? I don't know. I think he's just put one card face down, and it was like, I feel like cards are supposed to be face down now. <laughs> yeah, so here we see Teferi into Teferi. These are uh, some of the pretty spooky draws out of Blue Eye Control. And, you know, if James didn't have a particularly fast start, which he did not, uh, you're going to end up in a situation like this somewhat often. Yeah, you're going to need Scrap Heap Scroungers and uh, some some cheap, powerful dudes to start putting pressure on this. And I yeah. say Scrap Heap Scrounger because you, you have to commit your creatures into the Wrath effects, and you have to do it now, and then you have to not fall behind when you do that. Yeah. And the the Grim Horror Specs is good at that. 
Um, but we don't have creatures in play to attack these planeswalkers currently, and that's right. a real problem. We are going to get in for three, which was going to attempt to kill Baby to Fairy, and that's not going to work. Yeah, set it right back on top of our deck with an Azorius Charm. And now we'll see uh, what James needs to do to try and rebuild this board. He's got four mana, a fifth available to him if he has a land in his hand. We'll see if he has the ability to do anything potent to really start chipping away at all these Teferis, but it looks like just Cast Order of Midnight is not really a uh, particularly potent start. And then I'm going to assume that we're going to cast this Silumgar Sorcerer, or Silumgar Assassin. I would assume as much. Looks like we are indeed. Um, so we've got a couple of two-power creatures, and yeah, Noble giving that one a read. It is definitely read-worthy. Uh, another land off the top here from Noble. Noble flooding out pretty hard here. Definitely in danger. Cast out though definitely helps with that. You've uh you've got some pretty good opinions on cast out. Why don't you go ahead and give us those? I feel very strongly about cast out. Um, this card is is amazing and you should play it. And uh, it's not amazing because four mana oblivion rings are good. It's amazing because three mana oblivion rings are bad and you never want one in your hand until your opponent has resolved the threat and then you have to go find the one that you begrudgingly put into your deck. Yeah. But with cast out. You can put four of them into your deck, not begrudgingly, because they never get stuck in your hand. And then when your opponent has resolved their Ugin, and you're like, what beats an Ugin? Uh, you have four outs that you're drawing to. Yeah. Not the one detention sphere. Pretty reasonable. Huh? It seems totally... I totally buy that. And, you know, in modern, uh, it seems a little more questionable, where we have a lot more high-power answers to things, where, you know, you want to diversify your th your answer base because people are diversifying their threat base, and, you know, the answers are just so much more efficient and powerful than, you know, four-mana flash cast-out is or whatever, even if cast-out cycles. But in Pioneer, particularly, you know, like, our best answer is, like, Azorius Charm or something like that, and, like, Counterspells. So, like, I'm much more... I can definitely buy this world where we're just supposed to put four cast down cast out in our deck because you know this this answer suite is just much less efficient and it makes room for cards like cast out to just be the best card and it's yeah. so easy to include a playset of a card that cycles for one mana absolutely in your deck. Um, especially because the cantrips in this format and the cantrips in modern as well are not real impressive like Nope. If someone told me they were playing Cast Out instead of Brainstorm, I would wait for the punchline. Yeah. But if someone tells me that they're playing Cast Out instead of Opt... Opt? Yeah, it's totally reasonable, yeah. All right, so speaking of Opt, Noble's going to go ahead and stick a card on the bottom of his deck. He's got Syncopate in his hand. Here's another Opt. Of course, both these lands will untap because it's a fairy. Looks like that one's going to be good enough. He'll leave... I believe that was a Blessed Alliance in his hand. He'll untap two of his lands, send it back over to James, and now I believe we've got a Teferi on eight... And if James does not find a way to deal with this Teferi this turn, we're going to see a Teferi Emblem, and that should spell the end of the game. Uh, that makes sense. Uh, James's deck is good at grinding. Uh, we haven't seen it here, but it does have Zathra Necromancers and Grim Horror Specs and Scrappy Scroungers, but uh, none of those matter when your opponent exiles all the time. Yeah. It's uh, not, not going to do it. So we just had uh, Noble's deck name explained to us. Um, Route is a 7-mana counterspell. A seven and, mana wrath, yeah, or is a is or, a five mana wrath of God, yeah, that you can pay uh, extra mana, <laughs> a total of seven mana to make it an instant to be able to cast it at any time you could cast it as an instant, um, and uh, with Teferi and Supreme Verdicts, you just end up both route. Oh, it's great. I was even reading the description of the joke and was still thought it was wrong. And I thought I was going to hear that it's five mana to fairy gives you access to seven mana on a turn. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, it's a little simpler than that. All right, all right. Yeah, we used to, we used to, sometimes in some situations, you see Quicken in Magic the Gathering decks. Uh, and I was informed recently that I'm not supposed to do that in modern anymore. <laughs> yeah, unfortunately. Uh, because we should just play to fairy. Yeah, definitely true. You know, we don't need to be quickening out all of our shenanigans because we can just put Teferi in our deck and Why that playing... out all of our shenanigans. Why are we playing that in Storm? Teferi? <laughs> that seems not the worst thing ever. Is that a drill bit? Hello. There are two drill yeah, bits in that drill deck. drill bit getting syncopated. Not going to do it, so... Yeah, drill bit feels pretty bad when you spend three mana on it. Yeah, um, here's the Teferi emblem. Ooh. And now I think we, uh, we're, we're going to be pretty done here. I think... Uh, 
James is going to end up with one, probably land in play at the end of this turn or something. And, you know, even if Noble can't draw extra cards currently, he's, you know, you can do something ludicrous like Teferi, pick up my cast out, draw a card, exile your land, cycle my cast out, exile your Midnight Reaper. <laughs> Why do we care about the Order of Midnight? Yeah, exile your Order of Midnight. Yeah, but who even cares about <laughs> that? Um, looks like this is activate Gyre Reach Sanitarium, Ooh. which is going to exile one of uh, James's lands. So uh, just go ahead and get that untapped one out of there. And I, I assume we'll see James go ahead and pick his cards up here pretty soon. This is not something that you're going to be able to actually realistically beat. Everybody talks about how you like can theoretically beat Teferi Ult, and I've seen, I've seen people try to do it many times, and it doesn't work. You can't beat Teferi's Ult. They they <laughs> ultimate their Teferi. They cycle one card, put you down to seven lands. You slam your uh, Liches Master, <laughs> and there were. Well, there was one month where the standard metagame was such that Lich's Mastery wins that interaction. It's true, it's true. Yeah, and here's Opt and Step. <laughs> Exile your Scavenger Grounds. Uh, scavenger Grounds just gets sacked in response, whatever. Um, so this Guy Reach Sanitarium um, with the Teferi Emblem is a very cute interaction. Basically, everything that draws a card with, Guy with the Teferi Emblem is a cute interaction. We know that Noble's won the game, and now he's just demonstrating yeah, man, for us uh, that's how the game is going James, to yeah. um, But the Guy Reach Sanitarium is there because of how it interacts with Narset. I'll talk more about that in a minute. Um, let's go talk about sideboards for a second. Yes, so in the board on Noble side, we have two Lyra Dawnbringer, one Dovin's Veto, two Aether Gust, one Narset Parter of Veils, one Summary Dismissal, one Pithing Needle, four Rest in Peace, and three Nyx Fleece Ram. What sounds good to you here? Um, if I like any of this, uh, it's Nyx Fleece Ram. I think the answer is that I don't like very much of this. Um, I could be convinced on Lyra. I could be convinced on Rest in Peace, actually. I take it back. Uh, Noble didn't see Sathrid Necromancer. He didn't see Scrap Heap Scrounger, because apparently those are in the sideboard. Um, but Rest in Peace turns off Grim Horror Specs, turns off uh, Sathrid Necromancer, turns off... Absolutely. Okay, so there should be Rest in Peace in this deck. Probably not four, um, but you, you want probably Rest two. in Peace in this matchup. Yeah, probably well, two. I mean, James probably just can't ever beat it. I guess the only way he beats might it be is true. if you draw four. Yeah, All that right. might that might be true. Maybe maybe three. I don't know. Anyway, we'll uh, we'll leave that to Noble to uh, to figure out. Meanwhile, on James's side, he's got three Orzov Enforcer, two Sorceress Spyglass, two Never to Return, one Disfigure, four Scrap Heap Scrounger, two Kite Sail Freebooter, and a Cast Down. So, uh, I think the Sorceress Spyglasses are pretty good here. We'll get to shut off some Planeswalkers. Uh, Scrap Heap Scrounger, nice recursive threat. That one sounds good to me as well. Kite Sail Freebooter, definitely where we want to be. Kind of try and rip the Supreme Verdicts out of our opponent's hand. And, yeah, we can probably cut some of the junkier cards that aren't generating us card advantage or disrupting our opponent when they enter the battlefield. To add to that, I'm definitely bringing in Never to Return. Um, mm -hmm. The front side is a Sorcery Seems Speed Heroes Downfall, um, yeah. so it kills Planeswalkers. Um, one of the things that's important is we're going to be cutting cast downs and fatal pushes and like whatever other removal yeah, spells. Yeah, we've got some tank to cut. And our opponent has Lyra Dawnbringers in their sideboard. He probably has um, Torrential Gear Hulk in the main board. Like, yeah, we don't know exactly what his features like are, um, but y you don't want to go down to no threats. Yeah, that, that sounds right to me. So uh, we'll see how players decided to sideboard. Interestingly enough, uh, I'd be somewhat surprised if Noble boarded in uh, Rest in Peace after what he saw in game one there. Um, so we'll have to see if he, you know, maybe gets run down by some death triggers in game number two and decides to take a look back at that rest in peace in his board. But I, I'd be pretty surprised to bring it in here after watching that first game, and I probably would not be bringing in rest in peace in this game number two if I were Noble. That makes sense. And uh, I'm... I'm glad to hear that, because there's nothing I would like more than to see uh, James run down Noble and force a game three. Yeah, definitely. So, looks like players have decided what their sideboard is going to be. Shuffling up for game number two here. Of course, game number one was, um, well, what's the word? Oh, kind of a route. Yeah, that's fine. <laughs> 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 so, we'll see if Noble can live up to route tribal name. Uh by uh, routing James one more time. Or if James can uh, maybe give a little bit of mono black fight back. So so uh, we're uh, right at the, the north edge of Washington State. 
Um, right across the border, the Canadian border in Abbotsford, there's a Pioneer. Uh, I'm not sure exactly what the event 1K, is. It's a one k. It's a Pioneer one k. That's tomorrow morning. It is. Um, are you gonna be there? Um, currently planning on it. Um, I'm uh, gonna be. Uh, partaking in some activities tonight that may or may not go quite late into uh, into the night. So uh, we'll see if I end up having, uh, really wanting to wake up early in the morning and doing that. Respect. But um, currently it is on the docket. And uh, speaking of which, uh, I do actually need to dismiss myself currently. So thank you so much, Brad, for being here with me in the booth. And uh, thank you for, uh, you know, working around my somewhat busy schedule today. Um, so I will have to leave you for the rest of the match. I assume you can, uh, take it from here. It looks like going to be a pretty interesting end of the match. So, uh, I hope that, uh, everything, everything ends up, ends up well. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I'm excited. It looks like Noble's on the mulligan yeah. and maybe to five. Um, yeah, but you, six. thank you so much for coming. Um, yeah, you I'll be back Monday. Yeah, yeah, I'll be back Monday. So, uh, see you guys then. Good luck, Brad. And, uh, win something in Abbotsford if you do, do end up best. going. So we've got something to brag about on Monday. Yeah, I'll do my best. Thanks. All right, so I, I was uh, chatting up with uh, Alex. Didn't take a good look at what Noble's hands were that he decided not to keep, but it does look like he ended up on a six that he's happy with. Um, looks like James is ending up on a seven. And uh, James actually prefers to go by Jim, so I'm going to make an effort to start calling him that. We've got turn one to rest, so let's take a look. There are Nyx Fleece Rams in the deck. There are a, There's a Syncopate. There's an Absorb. There's two Cast Outs. Uh, and one land. We cannot take the Nixley's Ram, and we may not have relevant removal spells to hit it post-board. And I'm being welcomed by Steven. I'm, well, I'm welcoming Steven. I'm being joined by Steven. Welcome, Brad. Oh, thank you, Steven. <laughs> <laughs> um, so we're watching uh, Route Tribal, which I believe you're familiar with. Route Tribal? Uh, it's Noble's Blue White Control deck, or it's probably your Blue White Control deck. Why is it Route Tribal? So I was super wrong on this one. Um, it's Route Tribal tribal because uh, Teferi Time Raveler makes your Supreme Verdict into an instant speed Wrath of God. Uh, and Route is the instant speed Wrath Got of God it. that we chose. I thought that this was going to be a story about five mana Teferi getting us to seven mana so we can cast Route. I was very confused. Well, you can't cast Route in this format, so that's, that's uh, sort of a... Well, you can't cast it twice. Problem. If you cast it the first time, they make you take it out of your deck. Oh, you can put it on the stack. That's uh, okay. Okay. All right. I don't know. We might not be tribal at that point. <laughs> cast it one time per tournament. All right. Well, what's going on here? So we have a kite self rebooter hitting the table. So we win turn one duress, turn two kite self rebooter on nobles mulligan to six. That seems not astoundingly favorable. Uh, I'm inclined to agree. Um, There's the a Nyx fleece ram, but we don't have a land. But we're cycling, I see. Yes. Uh, on, the, on the mulligan to six is how we ended up in this situation. Um, I'm a huge fan of cast out. I was talking about it earlier, and this is exactly why. Um, I mean, I guess I would rather just have a land than a cast out in this situation. Um, but I'm so glad that I don't have well, four want, drops in my hand. Yeah. When you want your cast out to be a land, it starts being some other card at least. And that's nice. Now, Noble and I, before the match, were actually talking about... Uh, he was wanting the Tension Sphere to be in the deck, and you know, there's a couple different reasons you don't really want that. Uh, one is Abrupt Decay, but the other one is exactly this: that you know, Detention Sphere does not look great that last turn. Yeah, you can play a Detention Sphere, <clears throat> maybe two Detention Spheres in your deck, mm -hmm. um, but they'll be clunky, and yeah. you can just put four Cast Outs in your deck and not worry too much yeah. about it. Um, Jim got to live the dream and played his Glint Sleeve Siphoner after having played a uh, Aether Hub. This is a dream I've lived many times. Yeah, but he's doing it in Pioneer. So it's it's much less cool here. I bought foil Glintsu Siphoners. Ah, oh, yes. And I still have my promo Aether Hubs, so we're, we're going to get get up to something at some point. Um, Jim's deck is really cool. It's a mono black aggro deck. Um, it's, a, it's a little light on the aggro. I believe it only has one, uh, two, one, one drop. Um, but it has a bunch of card advantage built into it. It's got Glint Sleeve Siphoner. It's got Kite Self Rebooter. It's mm. got Zathrid Necromancer, and almost all of its threats are humans. Yeah. And Grim Heart Respects. Ooh. Yeah, Jim chose to sacrifice the Glintsu Siphoner here, which isn't really something I can get behind. I don't I don't think he cared too much that Noble gets his syncopate back. Suppose that's true. Um, this Jace is going to enter the battlefield and tick up to give 
all creatures that attack noble uh, minus one minus oh until end of turn, um, which means that Kite Sail Freebooter has zero power. Well, all of noble's opponent's creatures attacking. That makes sense. They don't have to attack noble, actually. Right. Otherwise, it would not trigger if they attacked Jace. Right. Yeah, or, you know, me. Correct. Um, I, I... Unfortunately, I'm not in the game, so that's not super relevant, but, you know. Yeah, because Jim can only attack his opponents, and uh, <coughs> since you're not sitting across from him, perhaps you've done something else to antagonize him, but it's not something I'm familiar that's with. That's true. I, I have had people try to attack me while I'm not in their game before, but that that's a little niche, I'll agree. So... All right, we're going to destroy the Jace. With a never. Yeah. Nice to get that done before Jace draws any cards. And there's a, a little bit of card advantage tacked onto that someday, yeah. hopefully not soon. And um, now Nick's Fleece Ram comes down, so we're all sort of treading water here. Which must be beneficial for the blue-white deck. Yeah, it, it certainly is. It's just a question of, you know, what is Jim going to do in the next turn or two? Um, as soon as Noble... You know, right now... I mean, the, the Kite Self Rebooter's attacking for one, the Nixley Shrimp's gaining one, so we're sort of at parity. You know, if J Jim has a window of a turn or two here where he can probably resolve something, you know, pretty impressive if he has it, but so far that's that hasn't really come to pass. Yeah, if the if the play here is return your... Oh, it might have to exile a creature. Maybe it can exile a card. I'm not actually... Oh, it's right here in front of me. Exile target card. Yeah, it's just card. Yeah, if the play here is Mega Four Man a two two, that's not very scary. That's not an impressive follow up, no. And this is where I want to see Scrap Heap Scroungers or Zathrid Necromancers or well, Grim Horror Specs. Yeah, and this is kind of why I wanted to keep. Yeah, why I wanted to keep the uh, Quincy Siphoner instead of the Kaisel Freebooter. You know, like, what 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 about the situation would change just because Noble has a syncopate? Not a whole lot. You'd just be drawing cards. And you did get to play a second Aether Hub, so you would have drawn yep. an additional mm -hmm. card immediately. Yeah, and then, like, the Nixley Serum can't block it. So now Teferi's coming down. And this is what I was talking about. You know, Jim has... You know, he's, he's really under the gun here to come up with something. And there is only a second Never to Return uh, at most available in the 75. Oof. Um, and I believe there's no... Uh, Swift Ends or Heroes Downfalls or Vraska's Contest. Yeah, if I, if I was playing this silo deck, I might like to have a couple more answers to Planeswalkers, though. Um, there are Sorcerer Spyglass. Okay, that's not so bad. Like that That's a great example of a card that could be really impressive here, because I think Noble can't remove it if it... I mean, it, it would be another Teferi, that's it. Because well, all, all the castouts are gone? Yeah, both castouts are gone. There's a... Uh, you know, I, presumably Jim would name the Teferi that's in play, and so then it would be the Time Raveler. That's, that's all. All right, another Glintsu Siphoner is a nice one. That'll put him up to two energy, three energy uh, when it enters battlefield. Three, yeah. Might even be four. What happened with the last one? Uh, it died during a combat step. But it get, gives one an entry, too? Yeah. So, so it should be... I think it went to zero because the first one um, paid the one that it made. Oh, we paid, for, paid with an entry. Yeah. Okay. Um, but in any case, he's going to be able to draw a card if he untaps with that. So we'll see what Noble thinks about that whole situation. Um, so Lyra, I oh. did want to bring this up. Um, so Lyra, giant monster, yeah. um, very good on this board. It's a five, five yeah. with lifelink. Um, but I wanted to talk about Archangel of Thune in the sideboard with mm, Nick's Fleet. You, you want to recreate that Protor top eight? I do. <laughs> uh, I mean, I, I lost several PTQ games to that combo in the weeks that followed that um, Protor. I think that. You know, you could bring in Archangel of Thune in places like Ly Lyra's just so much better at being a card by herself. The 5-5 five, five is better is. than the 3-4? Well, yeah, and the first strike matters quite a bit, that that kind of thing. Uh, so I, I think that, you know, so often, and so often you play Lyra and you're like, okay, this needs to kind of, this needs to kind of do it all, where, you know, gaining 3 life instead of 5 life on the block might be the be, be a bad thing as well. And I suppose if you tap out for an Archangel and your opponent goes Chandra Torch of Defiance or Glorybringer... Uh, you're much sadder if that angel is Archangel of Thune. Yeah, absolutely. That that matters. You know, the fourth, the fifth toughness right away matters a ton. So I, I don't really think we want to try to do that. Uh, Next to is honestly one of the cards I've been less impressed with in my sideboard in the first place. That's fair. Um, we have a big butts matters deck in the room, and I bet Next to looks great there. I, I'd have to imagine so. Um, so Lyra got in a combat step. Uh, I believe that's putting Jim to fourteen, um, and then he's going to be going to thirteen during his upkeep. Uh, and 
back in 2009, 2010, when Baneslayer Angel was in the format, uh, it was just common knowledge that if they hit with the Baneslayer Angel, it means they turned it sideways and it didn't die, and that means the game is over. That was a little less true Weird. for Lyra. Yeah. I mean, there's a lot more going on in this game here. So we see the Glimpse of Sefner get put on top with an Azorius charm. You know, no, Nova kind of has a long way to go. There's not any other damage. So Jim has a full three turns. He can sort of just shrug off that Lyra for another turn or two here. Assuming that Noble doesn't put together some counter magic or something else. It's really the Teferi that I think you're more concerned about. Um, well, also, I think I think Jim might be drawing pretty close to dead on answering the Lyra. Um, he has Fatal Pushes, he has Cast Downs, he has Silumgar's sure. Assassins. And how much of that is even still in the deck? And yeah, none of that hits Lyra. Right. Um, and then he has two Never to Return, one of which has been spent. Yeah, that's, that's not great. So, yeah, maybe the Lyra is just going to go the distance. There's nothing that can be done. The top card of his library is definitely not a never to return right, because it's a glint sleeve siphoner. And even if even if he draws a never to return, you know, how, are we, how are we beating the Teferi from there? That's true. That was that was the card we needed to find the answer <laughs> yeah. to the Teferi. So it, it does it does seem like Noble's sort of presented uh, enough threats that you're just not super well equipped to answer. Oh, and we're digging through time. That's always good. End of turn eight mana dig through time is not before. one that I think I've seen. And it happens a lot when you bring in rest in peace. I guess that makes sense, but I would be inclined to think the game would end before you got to eight mana. Or that you should board out rest in peace in that case, but you know. Um, I mean, this deck is planning to get to eight mana. One of the things that keeps being joked about is the fact that the deck has an extremely hard time turning on its one field of the dead but that's fine that the plan is to once you play your like 12th land to turn on your field of the dead you don't actually care about it for the rest of the time it's just to do something eventually is there a muta fault in the deck no okay i also think that i should probably cut the field of the dead no <laughs> absolutely not i love it <laughs> uh castle Harden is quite a bit better mm-mm mm-mm <laughs> Uh, it looks like Jim was n not able to answer the Lyra. Oh, I thought Noble was picking up his board. No. It looks to not quite be the case. Noble with a, I think that's a backup Lyra in hand, too. So this is, uh, look, this is looking pretty grim. Noble at 36 here. It's hard to imagine we make it all the way back. Uh, yeah, given that we think there's one card in Jim's deck that can kill a Lyra... Um, chump blocking Lyra with Kite Sail Freebooter is not going to get you where you need to go. Oh! Oh, that's a good one. Well, it's not going to resolve, but that was certainly an answer in his deck. Yeah, okay. one I'm surprised to see still there, um, but well, you need ways to kill Lyra. There's, yeah, I mean, there's a reasonable, there's a reasonable expectation that your opponent's going to do something like this. Uh, oh man. All right. I, I like this plan here. You know, line it all up so that you can do the double in one turn. It's going to be really upsetting when this next Lyra comes into play, but... Oh, eight mana dig through time, huh? Well, I've got something for my eight mana, too. Yeah, exactly. It makes you wonder what resulted in it not getting cast a turn earlier. Sure. Oh, do we play a Glint Sleeve Siphoner and draw right. two cards this turn? Maybe we drew both Chupacabras. Uh, it's entirely possible. I was going to say that perhaps Jim had, you know, sort of sandbagged both of them until he could play them in one turn so that it would be harder for Noble to answer it all at once. Although Noble has enough mana at this point that might, that might not matter anyhow. But yeah, you always if, have the chance that Noble yeah. taps some of his mana. Right, of course. The second Lyra, though... I mean, we've discovered that there's more than what we talked about before to answer it, but... Yeah, maybe there's, maybe there's something else. It maybe would we're... It would be surprising if there was a third... Ravenous Trooper Crab awaiting in the wings here. If just right now Jim slants his worst fears and then has Noble minus three his Teferi on his Lyra. Mm, indeed. I mean, the Kite Self Rebooter gives us a turn. Although, I guess how many counters are on the Teferi? Maybe that's not true. Uh, I think that this Freebooter has been keeping the Teferi at parity. Okay. Um, like, so the Teferi keeps drawing cards. It's not maybe. great. Blood Soak Champion. That would have been good. Um, seven however many turns we've played ago <laughs> nine I'm gonna go with nine <laughs> all right so this is the turn that Jim needs to chump block oh or that's fair he does have enough counters yeah okay so so the presumably the kite self has been keeping Teferi at parity but parity happens to be enough yeah parity is 
five we in this case, or perhaps four. Seem to be done with this game. Oh, uh, Jim is still figuring out where his siphoner go or his freebooter goes Noble's but noble's done with this game <laughs> noble's clearly finished um and that's a nice clean 2-0 and that's going to conclude our tournament here um we do have a top four for some additional prizes um but it, it's pretty normal for players to split those prizes and head out so we're definitely not going to wait 21 minutes to see if we have something to show you on camera um so we are going to clean up here but uh you are playing a Pioneer 1K in Abbotsford tomorrow. That's right. Um, and I heard that you are planning on changing your deck? I'm probably going to play Kethis tomorrow. Uh, the, the deck I played today, I played mostly because I uh, arrived very late to this tournament and didn't have time to put a deck together. Oh, yes. Uh, so uh, I'm, I'm mostly got most likely going to play Kethis combo tomorrow. Um, I, I haven't, like, done a huge amount of testing for this tournament or anything like that. I'm mostly just going to go up to Abbotsford, try to have some fun. Um, haven't been up to Abbotsford in years, so hopefully that'll be fun. House of Cards is a pretty cool store. Uh, you know, we'll, we'll, we'll see how it goes. I'm not expecting anything huge, but uh, Kethis combo I think is a pretty strong deck, and it's one that is very hard to play against, and people probably aren't prepared for it particularly, so we're going we're gonna to try to kill some people and see how it goes. Awesome. Um, well, thank you so much for stepping in the booth so that I uh, wasn't by my lonesome for this last round. Um, I'm going to take one more opportunity to tell you guys about uh, who we are and what we do here. Um, we're Paradise Games. We're in Bellingham, Washington. Uh, we stream our Monday Modern and our Friday Night Magic. Our Friday Night Magic is typically standard, but we're playing Pioneer tonight and we're playing Pioneer tomorrow, or sorry, next Friday. Um, and that's in anticipation of a Pioneer 1K that we're going to run here on December 14th. Uh, thank you guys so much for watching. If you're watching us live on Twitch, um, you can go through and watch some of our previous broadcasts on YouTube. The YouTube name is Parodice Games, uh, just like you see there um, with the O apostrophe space dice. Uh, and if you're watching this on YouTube, um, watch us live sometime. We're at twitch.tv slash paradise games. Um, with that, uh, we're going to listen to Hot Damn Scandal and head on out. Thank you guys so much for watching. <laughs>